Hello. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Jerry, are you guys on? I think we can start the recording. Maybe. It started. Okay, you want the street lights, Betty? Uh, Betty, Brenda. So we're back in. We're back in public session for the budget hearing. I just want to say before we go on to uh, Bucky on the street lights, I just want us to be cognizant that we do have. We've only gotten a quarter way through, and today is supposed to handle all the departments. So if we could be a little bit more efficient um, uh, going through, it would be very much appreciated. <laughs> okay, Bucky, you're up. It's 183. All right. 183. 183. So the streetlight budget is the streetlight budget. I think everyone understands how that's developed. It's a formula that that uh, multiplies the number of street lights you have times a what they call a tariff at the at Pura, and uh, that's your bill. This year's bill is in line with the budget, meaning the budget was 503. Uh, actuals to date, seven months is uh, 255. So uh, the budget seems uh, appropriate uh, unless Pura changes the tariff for the UI company. That that. That tariff remains the same. <clears throat> Good. Yeah, pretty straightforward. I just had a two, one, two quick questions. Is there any argument to be made? Because people feel like they're, you know, people. I, this is a complaint I sometimes hear is like, the electric bill is so, you know, whatever the, the negotiating with this company, and and maybe it's not relevant here. Um, the tariff you said is what it is. Is there anything that we can do as a community? Is there <laughs> offsets? And maybe that's not a discussion for this moment because it is what it is. And then the LED, are we? Is there energy savings and a cost analysis? And again, maybe not for here, but I do think it would be interesting for people to know um, with LED use if there is any environmental impact or cost savings because it's something worth noting. Okay, that's two questions. Yeah. Uh, the bill is the bill. It's 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 established by Pura. It's the same. Right. A methodology used to develop the fire hydrant uh, cost. Uh, they go to Pura and uh, they're awarded a certain number of dollars per unit. So if you want to write to Pura, you can do that. I can tell you that in the wings, we have some mitigation measures that uh, we are looking at that we think can be. Uh, uh, very helpful in terms of the energy uh, use in town for more than just street lights, but for a lot of other buildings. And it can happen quickly. Uh, I don't want to reveal it yet because it may or may not happen. So, uh, so that's that part about it. Have there been any savings? You know, three years ago, your budget was $711,000. And as soon as the LED lights were put in, it was reduced to just over five hundred thousand dollars. So yes, there are savings. Not to mention the impact on the environment, and those are things worth noting. Thank you. I'm all good on this budget. <laughs> so Bucky's got the next um, two items. Um, so page one ninety-seven. Page one ninety-seven. Okay, page 197 is the Public Works Administration budget. You'll see that there is a 9.5% increase in this budget. Uh, that's largely due to personnel. Uh, just as an oversight for all of these budgets, uh, with the exception of personnel, all of the line items are virtually the same as last year. It's the same budget you approved last year. There has been some uh, uh, changes in personnel. Uh, for the public works budget, if you look at the salary page, uh, we have uh, very close to last year's budget. We have, looks like we've uh, right-sized the director's salary here, uh, and uh, uh, we 
we've reduced uh, the assistant director's salary, uh, but we've added a finance person. And this is the, uh, the individual that I have been recommended recommending since I began to do the capital plan and realize the volume uh, of capital that uh, is, is facing us be because of the needs of the town. Uh, I felt that uh, one of the weak points was that the financial piece of this in, in some of the projects that I reviewed uh, did not have adequate oversight. And uh, in other positions, uh, one of the most uh, uh, valuable people in the office was, was that individual who oversaw the budget. So with the volume of capital we have to deliver and the amount of dollars that uh, are involved, uh, the first selectman uh, saw fit to add that position um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a worthy uh, uh, position to ask for and be awarded. So <clears throat> I got a couple of questions on this. Um, do we have a job description yet for this position? <clears throat> well, you know, I've had, I have job descriptions from other places that I've worked. Uh, if it if it's approved, it's, it's we have the semblance of a job description. Um, can I no, can I, I what they have. Yep. Yeah, can I can I get a look at what one might look like, please? Um, here's here's my concern. This is an area that I'm obviously very very familiar with in terms of finance, and. I do think this position was probably called out. Was it not related to the audit of what happened with the fill pile issues and the like? Wasn't this one of their, I don't know that this was a specific recommendation, but I want to understand how it plays into that. Um, it, it, was, it was Tom, and just to be clear, um, you know, obviously the reorganization took me and my administration literally we were working on it before be a pass it so we would be prepared. The right. came on, he talked about his position he had in prior uh, when he worked in prior administrations and how it was helpful and it makes sense to do based on what we learned in the audit. So it's not a new position, it's replacing another position, but it is a new position. So Yeah, no, it's a it's a new job description. I, I totally understand and I think it's it's so probably high time. Work. We're going to base it on what Bucky had in the past and what he needs for his department. Well, here's my concern. I'm currently working with a client and had to build out a financial staff for that client. Um, and it's very, it's a very challenging uh, job market for employers when it comes to qualified finance personnel right now in roles like this. I, my only question is, does a, does is seventy five thousand dollars the appropriate salary level for this? Are you going to be able to find somebody? Now, clearly, I don't know municipal, but I know accounting and I know finance. I don't know municipal in terms of hiring prices, is what I mean. But I know accounting and finance, and and people are going for a lot higher salaries than that right now. So I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you that uh, the last. Two people I had working with me would not take a full-time job because they had young children. They just wanted to work 30 hours a week, and both jobs were around $40,000. One was a CPA, another was an MBA, and they were happy as hell to have the job. So you're right. You're right, Tom. Uh, it depends on the individual. And if a superstar walks in the door, I would advocate you pay that person. Uh, what you have to pay them because there's no one more valuable in the office uh, than that individual. Yeah, and that's why I want to, and that's Bucky, why I want to see the job description because I want to take a look at that and compare that to what I'm seeing out in the marketplace um, 
for, for the price point for the position. I think based on the fact this was a a DPW audit recommendation, uh, the fact that it is somewhat commonplace in other towns, as you've pointed out, <clears throat> and the fact that we've got uh, millions of dollars of exposures related to the fill pile, et cetera, um, I, I do think this is a, a warranted position. I want to make sure we have the right job description, the right person, and the right pricing for it. That That's really what I'm not quote unquote concerned about, but I want to focus on. May I add so something? I can, oh. I can just jump in, Tom. Yeah. Um, I, you, I can assure you, I put your mind at ease that uh, those are the things that I'm handling and working on with our HR department. I know. And we think that that, that amount um, will get us where we need to be. And if, if, if so happens that we can't uh, necessarily uh, get anybody for that amount, although we do believe we can based on Bucky's prior experience, um, we, we, we will have to come back and ask for additional money. But I think right now um, we're on so, the right track. So just, a, a, I think the position is warranted and all that, just as a frame of reference, okay? I know the accounting firms are paying new hires uh, some of the bigger firms in this area are paying new hires right out of college between seventy five and eighty five thousand dollars right out of college. I don't know if that's what you're looking for. I don't know what this position is, um, but I know that's what the marketplace is in in some instances here. That's all. In an effort to try to get through this uh, list that we have, I'm sure Bucky can talk to you about this offline, some of the things he utilized and the kind of yep. uh, skill sets he used in prior uh, jobs that he had. Yep, I agree. And I, if I may, real quick, I would just like to, again, make the case for why it's really important to see this particular hire within the context of the broader plan for reorganization. Um, you bring to this, Mr. Marsilio, like incredible amounts of experience, and I trust, but this is also about building out um, for a uh, plan for the future and long term and, and building out a metric and an, and an org chart that can exist in spite of you and in, in spite of your great experience that you bring to the table. So I'm not questioning um, the need for it or the dollar amount. I leave that to this other conversation, but I uh, just wanted to point out in the, it would be helpful in the context of a broader plan to understand this. But um, again, I understand that is forthcoming. Just wanted to make that comment and thank you for your, your work and stepping in in the way you did. Okay. I have no specific questions. Go ahead, Bucky. I'm good on the admin Go side. Um, <clears throat> so we're on we're on page two oh two. Uh the reorg for the entire department is two percent lower. Um, again, you'll see that the changes are specific to payroll, and consequently Social Security, and the only increases are the anticipated increases in, in, in gasoline and fuel. Uh, and if you go to the personnel summary, you will see that um, the changes in the um, the changes in the uh, in the payroll are are reflected in the um, in the reduced budget. So there was a number of positions that were openings that were we, we, uh, that, that were, came from the retirement, the early retirement program. Uh, one of those, two of those weren't replaced. One of them was replaced with a, a lower uh, uh, level position. Uh, and um, the rest of it remained uh, just about the same. 
So when you say lower level, like the area of mechanic, it feels like with so many conversations about the trucks and being old and some of that, like the chief mechanic, for instance, is not necessary if we have a more junior person. Is that an example of what you mean? So we're going to wait and see. So we're going to replace the chief mechanic with a junior entry level mechanic. And instead of merely uh, uh, appointing someone as chief mechanic and then having to hire an entry level mechanic. So what we're gonna do is hire the entry level mechanic and then out of that universe of, of uh, employees, uh, we're going to enter into a meritocracy and a needs assessment to see if we need a chief mechanic, number one, and number two, who that should be. Okay, it makes sense. And one final question, I think, for me is mostly a curiosity. There is a large percent increase in percentage, but not in number in laundry and linen. What's that about? Oh, that's, uh, that was my, uh, when I first arrived, I, uh, I noticed that there was a uh, very lax implementation of uh, High vis wear, meaning uh, the high vis vest, jackets, uh, and the like. And I implemented a program where everyone has to wear high vis uh, clothing uh, for safety reasons. It's, I mean, I've seen uh, what happens if you don't do that, and it's not pretty. So um, that reflects the need to buy new uh, uniforms. For and, and new uh, high vis uh, equipment for the workers. It's a safety uh, cost. And a final comment um, with regards to a lens of sustainability, and I guess maybe it's an overall philosophical question: Is are there where possible without the, within the framework of the line items in this budget um, considerations being made towards sustainability and clean energy? And so on and so forth. Or can you comment on to how? And if now is the not the moment, question. yeah, go ahead. The answer to your first question is yes, emphatically. And the answer to your second question is I would like to defer to that answer until I have something a little more uh, a little more solid to share with you. But we are pursuing it. We're pursuing it all the time. But we have some very very exciting things that we're going to be presenting very shortly uh, that uh, I think address your issue. Thank you very much. All right, I've got a few questions. Um, let's go to the utilities. You spoke to it. Talk to me about the assumptions you made on fuel costs and were those assumptions that are used throughout this budget, not just in your departments? Okay, finance generally, uh, factors in something in fuel costs and in uh, utility rates. I thought they um, used to, I actually thought they used to work with the department head in DPW to come up with it or with purchasing. I, I could be wrong about that. I think purchasing would probably be a more valid uh, source. Uh, we, we could give you usage, but the crystal ball for- Well, did you, give them, did you give them usage? I think what I think happened here is I think usage increased a little, but the cost of fuel went down. Now usage increased because of COVID, because we did not put two people in trucks. So we had to double the use of, of trucks. Instead of having four, go, four fellows go out in two trucks, we had to go in four trucks. So there was probably more usage this year, so it could be an aberration. Uh, in terms of the unit cost, uh, you know, we have the experience of the year and we have some idea that it's gonna go up next year. That's the best I can tell you now. Thank you. The, um, Jared, I see you up there. Can you uh, opine on this? And then I wanna go back to something else. utilities commodities were uh, done online and so we uh, we supply
identify the rates and asked the, the each of the departments for their usage amounts and came to the number. Did you uh, take into so account what? It, yeah. Did you take into account the the whole comments regarding COVID and usage or no? Uh, this year, we I, I I believe the departments that were giving us their usage took that into account if it was a factor in their operations. Can we just check on that just to make sure? Because I'm seeing some large increases in these utility costs. I'm not saying they're wrong. I just want to understand them. The other thing is, and it'd be interesting, I think Mr. Bremer was working on something on this at one point, but we've done a lot of investment in kind of green energy, solar, all that kind of stuff the last few years, which we've been very proud to do. Now, when we've done that, um, we've always heard that there was going to be cost savings in some instances, can, um, significant cost savings from doing that. I, I haven't seen a report on that. Um, I don't know if somebody there can comment, but what, what do we know about our efforts on that side and what we've been able to save? I can't speak specifically to the amount of savings. I can say that we did that uh, the first elect woman and Tom Bremer um, did do a, ask for an audit to be done, an internal audit to be done on it. And uh, that, that has been done. And I know that uh, during the board of finance meeting that's upcoming, our internal auditor is gonna do a report on all the different audits that she has done over the past year or so. And so that will be part of it. Mr. Bremer, do you care if, yeah, Mr. Bremer, if you're on, do you care to comment at all? He stepped out for a minute. Sure, he just ran out. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I would I would like to hear that same report just because it's been a concerted effort that we've had over the last number of years. So I'd like to understand that a little bit. So if we could get some follow on on the utilities across the town to see whether there's a rate or volume and just confirm that I would be most appreciative. Um, because like I said, if you look at even the utilities electric, it's well, that's pretty flat. It's up over 20 by a lot. Um, but I just want to see what we're going here, what the driver is, if you don't mind. And I see the motor vehicle fuel has gone up quite a bit. So I'd just like to understand that. Um, the staffing is fine for me. I would like to go through the capital outlay and understand that a little bit, if you don't mind. But I'll, I'll defer. I don't know if Nancy has anything or Brenda has anything to say. That's fine. Well, it's my budget, Tom. <laughs> I don't have much to say. All right. I have questions. I want to put it together. Um, there you go. But, uh, so, but yeah, I hear, you, I hear what you're saying about this. This has been a long standing issue. and. Uh, Tom Bremer met extensively with Ed Bowman over many months and trying mm. to get their uh, minds around, um, you know, all the, the, the savings that were said we were having based on all the clean energy stuff. But it's, that's a really detailed conversation, and I think that's something that we could put on maybe a board of selectmen agenda for another time. I agree, Brenda. I completely agree. But I would like to do that because it is – and look, these projects will continue to come up and green energy is fine. And in fact, you know, I'm on the state of Connecticut's green bank, but I do want to see what the financial impact of it is based on what we were told originally. So. Yeah, we can do that at another time for sure. Yeah, let's go to the, um, so the public works operation, the capital outlay. Um, questions for you on this. The. The way this used to be was the numbers indicated priority with obviously number one being the highest priority and number 10 being the least priority in this case. Is that still the case here? Are these stack ranked? I do not think so. I think that um, these are prioritized to this extent. Um, what does uh, that mean? More Sorry. Requests. There were, there were more items requested than you see on this sheet by about a couple hundred thousand dollars. And oh, I'm sure. We were, yeah. And once once we were successful in uh, in uh, the 
capital budget. Uh, and we were formulating this budget. I went back and I said to Jeff and fleet maintenance, you know, we've got to cut a couple hundred thousand dollars out of this budget. So I, he went in and, and he developed this. Um, so if you, if, you, if you want some input here, here's what I have for you. Numbers four and five were asked for last year and were not funded. Uh, the miscellaneous equipment, is are those are those items we use every single day that just uh, have to be yeah. replaced in the course of the year. Uh, the second one uh, is a utility body drunk uh, truck, uh, which replaces a, uh, a two-ton vehicle, so a substantial vehicle. It's got 171,000 miles on it. Number three has 133,000 miles on it. Uh, number six is another uh, dump truck, and I believe that's a Mason dump truck. It's one of those trucks that doesn't have a lot of mileage put on it, but it goes to a site every day, and they, they'll use that to carry masonry and the like, and then uh, do their work and then bring it back. Uh, but a comp air compressor is an air compressor. It's replacing one that's you know, quite old. Uh, number eight is my understanding is that it's a, uh, a one of those little uh, vehicles that that got stolen, and they they got it back, but it was pretty damaged, and they use that for maintenance on the beach, and then you have. So is that uh, is that a similar vehicle? Is that the ones that also do they rake the beaches at all or no? No, no, that isn't Tom. That that is uh, a little four wheel drive guy that that they pick up trash on the beach, but they don't, they don't haul uh, the beach rake with that. You need a bigger vehicle than this to haul that beach rake around. Uh, but this would be to uh, maybe pick up a trash can here or there, uh, empty a trash can that's overflowing, throw a couple bags on, on it, and, uh, and, and do general maintenance around the beach. And the last two are, uh, are for uh, uh, mowing and uh, and grooming well let me ask you a question are. let me ask you a question on the last two um maybe some of the others but specifically the last two i thought a lot of our field maintenance item i, th I thought that was outsourced to third-party vendors that's true that's true i uh, i know it's not all outsourced and quite frankly i'm i'm still trying to get my arms around what what uh, park areas are ours, and what park what park areas are farmed out? And uh, so I'm I, I know generally what they are, but it's just something that's seasonal. So I haven't been able to put eyes on it and see exactly what what's happening. If you, if you can understand that, I do. I actually I do understand that. I'm just trying to figure out if we need to buy these items, if we're outsourcing them. And I, I had heard, um, you know, you hear through scuttlebutt and stuff that sometimes our vendors are using our equipment to do work. And that's something that if we're outsourcing it, I would like them to be using their equipment as opposed to our equipment. Um, so I, I saw this and that immediately spurred that in my, um, in my thought process. Well, that's news to me, and I can assure you that I will be looking into that. I Yeah, and I have no idea. Like I said, put that under, chalk that under, you know, people see me around town and say, do you know? And I don't know whether they have valid information or not. No. You know what I mean? I value, I value that input, and I will, um, I can tell you I will be watching out for that. Yeah, I'd look for that, and I'd look at the small power equipment, too, because I've heard similar. Okay. Now, this has been aligned with, I think you said this, this has been aligned with the capital budget that's already been uh, moved forward that has you buying about $3.5 million or so worth of trucks over the next two to three years. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And these are the trucks that are under $100,000. 
Yeah, these are the under $100,000 and have generally, if you're lucky, have a 10 year life. Yeah, I understand. All right, I'll let that go now. Thank you. So Tom, just to clarify, you know, um, obviously there was a lot of deferred purchases on, ma on trucks, on a whole bunch of things for a many number of years. And so what we're trying to do, as you mentioned during the capital project, is do catch up on the bigger ones and also on the smaller ones. Now, uh, they put together a list that, you know, they, this is what these guys do. This is what they put together. I trust them. Uh, I had asked Bucky to shave off some money because I thought that the capital outlay was a little too big. And I also asked that uh, of Chief Calamaris as well because they were the biggest drivers in the capital outlay. So that's why they shaved off some money there. Not that we didn't need those things. I was just trying to keep keep our costs down because I didn't want to uh, hit people, or hit our residents with too big of a tax increase. So I've come back wherever I could possibly do so. Yeah, no, I totally understand. Thank you. Um, I'm good on the rest of this budget. Okay. And the next one is what, uh, Jerry? The next one is uh, 227, solid waste and recycling. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so the same rule applies here. The budgets are virtually the same as the budgets approved last year. No big change. Uh, there's been major changes in the um, personnel. Uh, the, uh, the manager and the coordinator uh, both uh, left. And uh, we are we have plans that are still being formulated uh, as to how to uh, pick up the uh, the burden that remains. I have I have pretty I have a high level of confidence that I know how to do this, and. Um, so we stand by this reduction in, 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 the, uh, in the regular salary. And again, I absolutely respect your, um, the breadth of experience you bring to this. Uh, the question is in the short term, are there concerns about where there will be holes in terms of, of those reductions or how it will be um, compensated for? I'm, I'm sorry, Nancy, your question was, are there concerns? Well, what the concern, how, how those uh, positions being eliminated are going to impact the day-to-day -day in the short term until you do figure that out or until it is something is put in place. Okay. So I don't have any concerns. I, uh, I oversaw all of this, this budget myself in Trumbull and it was not only for Trumbull, but it was for three towns and I didn't have a coordinator and I was my own manager and once you get it started and you get the right people uh, uh, in place for the day-to-day -day operations, it becomes a, a matter of filing uh, reports to DEEP and uh, monitoring the subcontractor. Subcontractor is the same subcontractor we've had there for 35 years. I mean, they know what to do. Um, you know, we have to rehabilitate that building, but um, for the most part, the operations per se, uh, I have a high level of confidence that we're going to be able to address whatever needs there are there. I, I really do mean in the short term until that time, is there, uh, will there be a hole in the short term as, as those things are put into place? I don't know what they would be. I mean, we have okay. we have a staff. Uh, the operator is the operator. There's no okay. problem with the operation. Uh, there might be a report or two or a billing uh, uh, that might be a little late, but we're going to deal with that. That we can. Okay. Control. I appreciate that. Thank you. 
jump in on the reorganization there, uh, Nancy. Uh, Mike Zimbruski was the solid waste uh, and recycling coordinator. He took the early retirement package. We're going to be merging that position into the assistant public works director position because it's a job that can be handled um, by that position. And so currently Ed Bowman is filling in as part time in his prior position until, and we are seeking to hire a new uh, assistant public works director and Bucky is actively engaged in that process. But other than that, as Bucky said, we have all the bases covered until we get to that point. And I, I would refer then again to the opportunity where the recycling piece and the sustainable piece there, you know, there is that opportunity there. So thank you. I have no further questions. <laughs> I, I have um, one question on this. So this is this goes to we have the wastewater treatment facility and all that issue going on. We have a variety for a variety of different reasons of open positions. Are we going to be able to move forward with that project in a timely enough uh, manner, given the, the turnover um, that's going on right now? And I know some of it was planned and some of it is is uh, due to other, let's say, outside circumstances. Um, do you mean the hardening the project? Yeah. I need the hard. I need, yeah. I mean the hardening project, and then for years and years we've been talking about the the rebuild of the entire plant, and I I just um we've had a fair amount of turnover in these positions as we've gone through this discussion of is it going to be seventy million? Is it going to be ninety million? I just want to know kind of how we're managing that in the. Uh, short to mid term where you rebuild a team. Okay. So and Bill, you can weigh in anytime you'd like on this, but let me start by saying okay. before uh, uh, the hardening project will resume in another 30 days. And we have every expectation that that will be done midsummer complete. And in terms of the uh, the, uh, the facility itself, we have one major step to take before we go any further with anything down there, and that is to do all the underground testing and have the entire site completely known to us as to what we're going to encounter before we go any further. Because this has been nightmarish. Bill, Bill will tell you, every time you put a <laughs> Shovel in the ground down there, it's problematic. So to me, it makes no sense to proceed with a design uh, of, of anything down there until you're absolutely certain of what you're getting into. And that's where we are right now. But uh, I, I, I see that, uh, that the capital budget reflects that, that uh, all of these projects will be done uh, or, or are on the capital plan. And what my job is here is to ensure that we have staff here uh, uh, that will enable us to uh, construct these projects uh, and have them come in on time and in budget. And we're going to need some internal people to do that. We're going to need uh, a capital projects leader in the office here to review uh, those uh, uh, purchase orders and the, and the requisitions and, and everything. There, there's an extensive program here that this town uh, uh, needs and uh, through, uh, through the boards and commissions in this town, they realize that now's the time to get these done. So, so it's a lot of money and I feel uh, obligated to make sure that it's, uh, that, that money is well spent. So, that's where we are in my eyes in terms of the construction at that site. There are a lot of question marks yet. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing further um, with Mr. Marsilio, I would uh, move to Water Pollution Control Authority and Bill Norton is on the line. 
Yes. What can page you... is that? 289 is the page on the budget book. Brenda. Uh, hello? Yeah, this is Roger Otori. I wanted to comment on the solid waste. Okay, you don't have to yell. You could. No, I didn't. Your... Okay. <laughs> um, okay, go go right ahead. I just wanted to say I'm I'm Roger Ortiz. I live at 1310 Melville Avenue, and uh, during 19 uh, 2017, between February and May, I was one of the scale house operators down there, and. Having cut out all these uh, department supervision and administration people, I think you're going to have a problem. It's not just filing a couple of reports to DEEP. It's not just uh, dealing with one or two things. There's a large volume of things that occur down there. When I was down there, we were taking out four 40-foot tractor trailer trucks of trash each day. I don't know what Trumbull is, but I can probably figure that it was much less than what we do in Fairfield. We have issues with the haulers. Those are the people with the garbage trucks. We have issues with um, the, the company Enviro, Environ or whatever they call themselves now. Uh, it's a lot of on-site inspection and review and basically getting in people's faces to make sure they're doing the right thing. It can't be done out of an office at town hall. That's why uh, I think it's, it's a bad mistake to get rid of everybody. I mean, you can Take care. Uh, there should be at least one person who's a supervisor in that uh, table of organization. That also, you only have four uh, scale house operators part time. What used to happen was Audrey, who was the coordinator, used to fill in on our lunch breaks, and also if one wanted to go on vacation, they needed to have somebody to fill in. And I know she was filling in uh, for the like third or fourth position for a while down there. I, I just think that to cut out everything and to put in a custodian placeholder thing in there is sort of giving the wrong idea and the wrong uh, observation as to what solid waste is. Okay, so well, that's all. Thank you, Roger, for that. Thank you. Um, well, we do have it covered, and we do intend. We were just talking about uh, the solid waste and recycling director position. I so hope so. We do so. have it covered. We, we intend to have someone there as well. Can I respectfully ask, Mr. Marsilio, is that do you have a follow up to that thought? Uh, by way of encouragement of what Brenda is just um, saying, uh, I'm aware of I'm 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 aware of Mr. Vittori's, um issues uh, in Trumbull. It was a regional uh, transfer station. We had more tonnage than Fairfield has. You have 33,000 tons. We had almost 37,000 Monroe, Easton, and Trumbull. Uh, so I know what the volumes are. I know what the uh, we had the for many years we had the same operator in Enviro, uh, and I know what it takes to operate the transfer station. And you are right. You know you need constant vigilance, but but and we intend to do that, and we will provide that. We will we're expecting to have uh, a town employee there pretty regularly. Uh, as needed, and I'll take care of it. We'll do it. And just to add to that, Nancy, the assistant public works director isn't going to be sitting at a desk all day either. Oh. 
I have nothing further. We're gonna, Thank have you. New, we're gonna have new improved employees doing a whole whole lot more than they were ever doing before. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> They're gonna be good. All right, Mr. Norton, you are up. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm here to present the uh, Water Pollution Control Authority budget. Uh, as you can see, it's a, a slight degree, this decrease, 0.08%, uh, roughly uh, flat budget. Uh, most of that reductions um, in our capital outlay budget. We had a large $170,000 uh, item last year for our uh, flights and chain in our primary tanks that we have received. We they haven't been installed yet. We need some good weather to start doing that inside these tanks. Um, so we reduced that. Uh, we also replaced the compressor last year that's not in there and uh, uh, one vehicle, one truck. Uh, we have some other things in there in air handling for this year. Um, uh, Bobcat that's used in our composting operation that uh, is utilized four or five hours each day, at least five days to six days a week. Uh, other than that, most light items have remained the same except for our maintenance and repair of equipment has gone up a little bit. Um, as Selectman Flynn said, you know, looking at the design of the new new system and the upgrade, a lot of this equipment has reached its engineering uh, lifespan. So it's getting more and more diff difficult to keep it operating. So uh, with that, some of these costs are going up and that's, that's one of those costs. Uh, right now we do have a uh, fine screen down that's gonna cost us in excess of $50,000 just in parts. Uh, we're doing <clears throat> all the labor ourselves, that, that, so that saves the town quite a bit of money that we're capable of doing that stuff in-house where there's no overhead and profit for a contractor to do it. So we're, we're doing that, uh, as I said, in-house. Um, as I said, most of the budget's flat. Um, uh, basically, as I said, most other items you know, were the, the, um, remain the same, and I just touched on the two main items. Um, with that, I'll open it up to any questions. I would love to um, talk to you, not approaching this uh, as my water pollution control authority commission uh, status, but knowing how much you guys have going on and knowing how much, uh, how many projects are coming down the line and knowing how, uh, how much our commission, the, the volunteer commissioners are working on these projects outside of, of the monthly meetings, is your budget accurately reflecting the ability to handle all of the projects that are coming down the pike because there are a lot of uh, them and big ticket items yeah yeah exactly and I, I i believe we are because this is basically the operation and maintenance budget this isn't the capital budget so right uh, those are, are funded through other sources not through this so i think this is a fair representative of what we need to operate and maintain the, the facility okay so thank you I don't have further questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with this one. I'm concerned as well just about the go forward projects. I know it's not in this budget, but just in general, um, making sure I know you guys work closely with DPW and the town operations and just we have so many moving pieces in those areas that I want to make sure we, we don't drop the ball on planning for a, a very large scale uh, capital improvement project that we've been talking about it seems like for six or seven years uh just to, to reaffirm uh, yeah. what john said earlier um we're going to have to look at a, a site-wide environmental impact study where it's going to look at all of the soils and analysis uh not only the soils and the groundwater and everything <laughs> that's basically under that uh the blacktop uh the only good aspect of that is there is not going to be a lot of digging involved with the with the upgrade project there's only really one uh building that's going to be erected for our uh, our influent and our uh, um pumping influent pumping and screening and uh, grit removal so um, when is that when's the environmental impact study when's it starting when's it done that's a, that's a good question uh select my flint uh i don't think there's a time frame on that right now um, but that's what have to be done initially it could be could be part of the design. It could be one of the first uh, aspects and in, in incorporated the design of the so, um, upgrade. Who, 
who's responsible? I know ultimately it's the commissioner, I would assume, but who's responsible for doing all that work and putting that together so we can get moving on it? Uh, obviously, we'd, we'd have to be over here all the town bodies to get that that design and, and environmental impact uh, statement approved, whether it's through bonding or and that, but who's the, who's the staff? Who's the person to congratulate on staff uh, is part of the town government, not the elected bodies. That's that's who's shepherding this. Who gets up in the morning and works on this every day? Uh, I believe uh, uh, one of those hats would be me. <laughs> right. I think I I would be the, the basically the boots on the ground. I'm the, there. I'm the one that's there every day overseeing that. Um, yep. I've administered two uh, two of these upgrades to two other facilities in excess of uh, uh, forty five million dollars. So I'm very yep. uh, familiar with these upgrade projects. Okay, so, so what's okay, but what's the timeline then? I get I get your credentials. I'm not questioning you at all, please. I just don't know what the timeline is for this. Like I said, it's it's this this project is one of those projects that um, seems to have been through the course of, and this isn't Mrs. Kupchick's administration. This has been for quite some time. It's been kind of it starts, it goes away. It restarts, we change people, it starts again, and then we decide we need to do this. I mean, maybe it's not for this meeting, but it's just, I, I want to know, like, you know, what's the progression here? And to, by your own admission, I just asked, what's the time frame for this? You're the guy boots on the grounds and you don't know the time frame for this. And I'm well, just trying to get... You know. Let me give you a quick uh, vision of what's been going on and where we're at please, right to this point. Please, yeah. uh, obviously, the town several years ago hired Ray Pierce to do a uh, facilities plan. That facility plan was completed back in 2017. Was it uh, submitted to the state, the EEP, for approval? Uh, we, re we received the approval probably back in mid-2019. Uh, the next step was to go for a scope of services with the EEP. We submitted that. Um, late 2020, uh, and then we received, uh, which is astronomical, like two, two weeks later, we received approval for the, the scope of services. So now we move ahead uh, to, to a, 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 an area where we can go ahead and approve the design. Uh, the design is going to be placed on the WPCA agenda this month. So for the March meeting, that will be placed on the WA, a WPCA uh, agenda for discussion. I don't know if they'll approve it to move it forward, but there'll be a discussion sure. this month, and then uh, and then we'll go from there. But what about the environmental impact study? Is that part of the design? Excuse me, Tom. Bill, can you share that information with the board? Of, I know Nancy's on it, but can you share when that meeting is? It sounds like Tom would love to sign in and hear more about that. When is it? Sure. I, uh, I don't have this calendar in front of me, but it's usually the third Wednesday of the month. Did you send it to the board of selectmen? So absolutely, well, just send it that way. Everybody yeah, will get it. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank all you. All that information, all that information will be presented during that meeting. Uh, yes, it will be part of that meeting to do for uh, discussion. I'm not sure if it will move uh, any further than right. that, but it, right, right, understood that. Well, you could learn a lot. You know, a lot of the answers to your questions could probably be answered at that meeting. Sounds like a good meeting. I see John has his hand up. <laughs> uh, Tom. Yeah. From what I could see, just from someone who landed here from another planet recently, uh, no one ever anticipated the problem in that area that emerged due to the build pile issue. Right. Uh, I agree. The, 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 this, I've never, I've never seen or heard of anything like this where every single shovel full of everything is, is uh, suspect and has to be tested and, and everything. So this has kind of slowed down. And when we're ready to um, uh, engage in a delivery process per se, uh, and go to design and, and begin this. One thing I hate, and I'm sure you feel the same way I do, I don't like surprises. I want to know up front when, what something's going to cost, and I want to make sure that uh, everything that could be done uh, prior to the project is done to ensure that. 
So that's where we are right now. Uh, we have, uh, I believe Laura Pooley is, is requested yes. a, uh, a budget to complete the testing of the entire site. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's gonna be done by the end of this summer. At that time, when we see what we have, we know what we're facing, it would be appropriate then to begin discussing the next phase, which is the renovation of, of, of that facility. And then there's, there has to be discussions beyond that into delivery methods and, uh, and the like. Yeah, no, I, I completely appreciate what you're saying as well as in, including the fact that we've had, let's call them unforeseen circumstances. All that being said, um, that is just even more of a reason to be very buttoned up over who owns what and how we get it, how we get it done. And again, it's, I've heard similar comments made over the past number of years, and it just has never seemed to move forward with uh, the speed with which we, we thought it might. So, uh, appreciate it. I look forward to learning more and hearing more during that meeting. So thank you. <clears throat> and it's like we feel, I think your concerns or timeline was uh, reflected by Tom Bremer too. He was one of the ones who said we either have to do something or get this project going. So yeah, I think that's probably right. And I haven't talked to Tom about that, but that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, if there's nothing further um, for Mr. Norton, I'd like to move on to engineering with Bill Hurley. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Norton. Appreciate it. Hey, can everyone hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah. of course, Bill. Yep. All right, what thanks. What page uh, are we on? 214. 12. Right? 212. Oh, 212. Okay, 212 for the message, 214 for the uh, budget. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, selectmen and selectwomen. Uh, basically, engineer uh, presented last year's uh, budget with the exception of uh, fuel and software price increases. Uh, a little bit high on the percentage, but relatively small amount increases. And um, that was for uh, yeah, IT uh, software and the uh, motor uh, vehicle fuel. And then the, uh, we are requesting a van, an engineering van for the capital. Um, it, it's a, it was an 18 year old uh, caravan uh, that was taken out of service due to the uh, safety concerns, uh, basically at a broken frame. Um, the van is utilized for office and field work and holds all sorts of uh, water and soil testing equipment, cones, uh, surveying rods, um, water buckets, construction signs. Um, and uh, distance wheels, whatever we, we have a need for engineering or for uh, surveying. Um, so um, if uh, I'm here for any uh, questions, if anyone has any. Mine are personnel related. Um, just want to talk about some of the switch up that's happened. Um, the addition of the, uh, the senior civil engineer versus the CAD specialist. Can you talk about some of that re Organizing. So I and can answer that, Nancy. Thanks. Um, yes, that was part of my reorganization plan. And, and just to be clear that this reorganization plan is based on many months of meetings with department heads and talking to them extensively about their department. So um, Laura Pooley, who is a, an amazing engineer in our engineering department, is going to be retiring in the next year or so. And the amount of work that comes into that department um, is, is significant. And Bill Hurley, while he's really great, he's like a one-armed paper hanger in there, and he's doing a lot of work. And frankly, we need, we need three engineers uh, to handle the amount of work that comes into the town. And so that was a decision made uh, to be able to move our town forward and to build our bench. Because I know Mr. Hurley, you know, he's not too far away from retirement either. <laughs> Someday, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, you have to you have to be prepared um, to have people, you know, experienced in understanding what we're doing. And so that decision is made because of that. 
And absolutely appreciate that, Bill Hurley, you function like four people, not one. So maybe there's something we don't know here because I've seen I've seen you in action. Uh, but then in terms of like some of the software technology uh, specialized, specialized skills that some people had previously brought to the table, is the assumption that those things will be taken up by the the addition of an engineer, of a, of a senior Correct. engineer? Correct. Okay. So this was put together through discussions with the department head as well as the first select woman's office and chief of staff and chief admin officer to agree on what this reorganization looked like? Absolutely, and our HR department. And this was, um, go ahead, Mr. Hurley, let me hear from you. Go ahead. Uh, I, um, I, yeah, as part of uh, the reorganization plan, uh, John and I are compiling a, a plan of uh, assignment of duties, um, you know, personnel and, and additional training. Okay, so this is again, one of those we're not you're not going down in a head count, you're adding a different position. Is that how we should read this? Yes. Seven people, different skill sets. Set. Additional skills. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. I understand. I do too. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I'm not Thank sure you. if Mr. Conley signed on yet. Um, Tom, are you I am on, on, Brenda, if you can hear me. Oh, sure, yep. Okay, Tom's going to um, um, talk about the building. What page? Yeah, uh, I'm not yelling, am I? I can never tell how people say I have a very uh, strong voice, so no, I may be fine. yelling, so I apologize. Page Thank you. everyone. How are you doing, Tom? I am well. How is everybody? Thanks for having me. Um, I, I'm this... not really sure where you want to start here. Maybe revenue. Maybe um, uh, we don't really have much increase in the in the budget line. Um, there is another. Um, it looks like another administrative so a, a, a floater in there. I'm hoping that that speaks to my request for a. A blight officer um, to handle some of the administration of that um, department. That will help all three departments, by the way, um, fire marshal, health, and ours here. Um, it has become a, a huge task for us to get the information out, to get our meetings together, and it's um, it's a bit of a uh, challenge month to month. So. Um, I think that that's really the one one big thing that would um, help everybody out here. So I'm hoping that 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 um, request can be uh, met and uh, help us with that challenge. Sorry, Tom. Hi. Thank you for everything. Um, what departments did you say that floater supported? Fire marshal. So um, so we we um, uh, we operate the blight the the uh, uh, condemnation blight um, uh, for the town of Fairfield. Yeah. And those uh, three three departments, fire marshal, health department, and building department, are on that committee. So we all go out and do the inspections. Um, so we run between you know, fifteen to twenty five um, um, blight complaints that we have to follow up month to month. So we have a meeting, and uh, we have to get paperwork out each time. Um, you know whether it's um, uh, you know, depending on where we are in that in that uh, condemnation blight uh, situation. So there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of administration, um, and I was just hoping that, um, as well as all three of our departments, very, very um, key departments in the town, I believe, have to go out on a monthly basis um, to inspect. Um, and again, you know, with health and COVID, they're, they're absolute, absolutely stretched to the limits. Uh, building department, uh, I'll speak for my department, is stretched right out. Um, I don't think we've seen volume like this um, on the residential level ever before. Um, we are still, just a just a, um, um, a note, we are still installing swimming pools 
in February. So, well, I guess it's March now. So pools have run through the winter. It's crazy. So. And just uh, jump in, Nancy, for a minute. Um, and I, I know that Tom has been talking about this position for some time, but actually this is an admin floater, Tom. And Tom, you know, had, took the early retirement and was gracious enough to come back uh, in a part-time capacity to assist the department as we are uh, in the midst of interviewing uh, building officials uh, to take over. But this is a floater that's going to be designated between zoning, building, and conservation. So for example, uh, you know, they need a little help uh, in conservation when someone's uh, taking a lunch break, uh, needs to answer the phone, a uh, so little help in building if they're overworked and they need some assistance, uh, and then going back to zoning. So those three departments obviously right next to one another. And we just thought this was a better utilization. We had hoped for more admins to actually take the VRIP, and we didn't get as many admins as we liked or would have wanted to, because we thought the floating positions could have worked in several areas of town government, but most especially in permitting. So that's what that uh, position is going to be doing. Which okay. may or may not, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I was I was hoping to steal a portion of that time, possibly, um, if well, there was a, an, an, a possibility. An, absolutely. Well, you know, I'm going to push think, very uh, strong for that. If I'm here, Brenda, I don't mean to overspeak oh, you, but um, I, if I'm I, here I uh, during that time, I, I'm going to push very strongly that we have somebody now, that can I, I at least devote some hours <laughs> every week for it. Absolutely. You know, so there's a lot of things we can be creative with, and there's more efficiencies we can always make uh, in coordinating together. So I'm looking forward to that position uh, being utilized and fully, more fully. Well, to that end, um, since this is a line item under building, the purview, I guess it leads to the question that, you know, we've just seen unfold. Who will that person be reporting to? So, for example, we were trying to figure out where we were going to put it. We could have put it under my budget as a floater amongst departments. We could have put it in HR, um, but we just figured we put it in building and because it's going to be a permitting floater. So, um, yes, it's going to be the new uh, building official who will be, uh, they will be answering to. Okay. And then uh, the blight uh, thing was, is that going to be in terms of, I, I mean, I guess not then, um, will this person be able to support or are we looking, at, is the building department going to be looking at what the blight um, ordinance looks like in town and, and redefining what that is? Do you anticipate more work in the coming year if, if changes are made to that? Hard to know. So the, so the blight, so, you know, obviously uh, Tom has talked about in the past going before the RTM to get tweaks made to it, which I think uh, that should happen probably after the budget season, I would imagine would be a good time to really uh, delve deep into that and looking at changes. Uh, but I think that this admin can handle the floating and if there's time, uh, if the admin has additional time during flow periods to assist, then that will be helpful. But I'm, I'm thinking that the new building official is going to be able to come in and do some reorg in that department himself or herself. That will create more uh, efficiency. Sorry, I, I was on mute. I have a question on the admin support here. Um, I would presume the building department is carrying the full cost of this position then? Yes. Yes. We, now, <laughs> just so we're clear, uh, we eliminated the admin position in zoning. Right. One of the ad. So this is a floater now between the three. And right. And just, just have to put it in building. Because building is like the lead on everything. And then um, how will that, in, the zoning piece then, if it's taken from zoning, that admin position, what what kind of hole does that create there? It's not. It's going to be able to flow between the departments. So it's just parked here, Nancy, for funding purposes, I guess, is what they're saying. Right. When zoning right. needs the admin to be in there and when conservation needs it, 
and then we're building these beds. Yep. Can we go then? Um, I don't have any other questions on expenses. Um, can we uh, go to revenues on this, which is page 11? Mr. Connolly, back for his swan song. Sure. Um, if that's page 11, I'm on add, page. Just want to add one thing um, to the blight. Uh, it was 5,000. We added another 5,000 to that blight account that Tom has been asking for for years. And that's in an effort to assist uh, people who get called on for blight who are really just sort of down on their luck or they're elderly or they're very low income and they just simply can't fix, let's say, a broken window or something that's getting complained about. That additional money in that account will allow us to call handyman service or something to go over there. And we had a situa situation with an elderly uh, woman, widow, who was, you know, just crying, calling here, just needed something small fit, and had our neighbor had called on blight. So we're able to fix that for that for that resident, and so that that fund I think will go uh, will go a long way in assisting residents who simply cannot fix uh, something that's a minor thing that's causing. Yeah, them uh, can I add something to that also? Um, We've had several incidents where people, um, although the blight um, ordinance is very effective at some range, uh, there are some people that just do not want to respond and they would accept the $100 a day fine, but not do anything to um, make um, any repairs uh, if repairs are needed. So we ran into that situation on Old Field Road here where we had um, a vacant home um, we, we were finding him, and I believe we still are, but he had um, uh, dead animals on the property. Um, so we sent the animal control. Um, it, the, the property was so dangerous in regard to vegetation and holes in the ground that we had to hire a, a, a landscaper to get in there and at least cut back the trees. The trees were falling into the uh, sidewalk. The sidewalk was impassable and you could not get a vehicle into the back here to clean up these, um, honestly, mid-summer dead animals. Um, so it was quite a quite a mess. So we, we um, um, the first select woman gave me permission to hire somebody. Now that, that will be transferred over to the $100 a day uh, fine that we, um, we charge that homeowner, um, you know, in that vacant property. So I just, you know, that's kind of an example, uh, an extreme example, but one of several we've run across and we didn't have any money to um, uh, to utilize um, in regard to that. So that's done not by, you know, that's done on a, a commission basis. We all get together and we say, yes, uh, this is a, an extreme need. So just one example. Right, that, that was a public health issue that the neighbors were actually their public their health was being threatened by this situation so we had to step in so we could protect those people yeah I thank mean, you people couldn't use their backyards on on sasco hill and oldfield roads you know because of the um well, quite frankly dead dead deer and and wild foxes that had inhabited um, and a vacant garage and holes all over the place. So very extreme measures. So anyway, that, that was taken care of, so. All right, you wanna to get to the uh, budget? Does anyone have any questions on his budget or on the uh, revenue pieces? I do. Um, Tom, in looking at it, it what's, where, are you at, where are you currently projected to come in this year? So this this year in in the 21 um, today um, today I'm sitting at um, revenues of just a little over a million and a half. We're still waiting on um, two fairly good sized um, projects from Fairfield U, uh, one one very big project, um, um, and then Sacred Heart is also prepared to come in with their um, their skating rink. So two large projects that. I believe are coming in in March, and I'm, I believe that that should fulfill our um, our um, revenue. Uh, there's a couple other small ones, and we certainly look at from month to month here um, uh, some of these large residential projects. We just code reviewed one last week, so one that we were unprepared for. I didn't even on Castle Avenue. Okay, 
So there's Tom, a lot in the mix. Yeah, I'm surprised given how busy you are and given your commentary about the pools and all that. I'm surprised we're not going to blow through this $3.2 million number this year. Well, we're going to, if, um, again, I think the fire marshal spoke to this. Um, quite a bit of our revenue is based on the larger projects from the universities. So, um, you know, and, and they're, they're sitting there. I just spoke to Walt Stapleton today about um, Fairfield U. I yelled at him because we don't have the demo on that convocation center up there get me the demo papers. I said, I need a check now. <laughs> of course, they laugh at you, but but they're ready to go. They want it down, and they're just waiting on some um, um, disconnect letters. It's, it's a bit of a process up there to get um, the high voltage disconnected from that building. Do we have, um, do you have better line of sight into next year? Do we have some upside here? Typically, you would come in and say, we've got these three, four, five, you know, big projects, and then if we do our normal volume, I mean, what's our line of sight for next year? Yeah, I wish I had a better um, fix. Um, the universities are not playing their hand. Normally, we sit down, and we talk, and they, you know, they have X amount of dollars. They're, they intend to spend money, uh, but not on these big jobs like they have been doing. So, um you know, I, I, I just, I don't have anything, um, any large projects. They certainly have a lot of small ones they're talking about. They always have, um, you know. Is that why you went with the years. average? Is that why you went with the average here as opposed to raising it or, or being a little bit more aggressive because you don't have any big projects in the pipeline? Absolutely, Tom. That, yeah, there's it's really no... Um, yeah, I have nothing in the pipeline. I, I mean, I have big projects, um, residential projects, sitting ready to go, um, but there are neighbors who are complaining, there's zoning, there's other issues out there that, um, you know, might hold those up. Uh, but but they're there, they're ready to go. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I just, you know, it's really hard to hang your hat on something like that when, when nobody's here with a check in hand. You know, or or at least a hey, we're going to do it, and we have the money, and um, you know, zoning's okay with it. So those are the big things that right. uh, kind of hold us up. Okay, and, um, and I'm, thank I you. I want to be conservative. I, I want to put the money in, but I want I do want to be conservative. I, I don't want to leave um, I hamstring my the, the, the whoever sits in this desk later and have them have to explain why he couldn't bring the or she couldn't bring the money in. <laughs> right. No, I understand. Thank you. Sure. That's all I have. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Conley. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And have a good day. Take care, Tom. You too. Yep. Thank yep. you. Next up Bye. Is Mr. Calabrese, who's got Penfield, Penfield Civilian, Parks and Rec, Waterfront, Carl J. Dixon Golf Course. H. Smith Richardson Golf Course. So take it away, Anthony. <laughs> can we start with the revenue side? Yeah, can we start with the revenue side? Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Anthony Calabrese, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, revenue should begin on page 17, as long as I'm reading that correctly. Yeah, it looks like you are. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll go right through it. Um, you'll see. Uh, Penfield numbers, uh, locker numbers, again, we're using a three-year average. Um, concession is a contract, so that's a, a static number. Um, the big you know, the big guesses here are really what's going to happen with our two pavilions. This budget assumes that those pavilions will be open um, you know, to full capacity. As of right now, um, we're currently closed um, until March 19th. March 19th, the governor has opened up wedding venues, commercial venues to uh, indoor capacities of 100 and uh, 200 people outdoors. Um, when we were putting the budget together at this time last year, um, obviously we were closed as we things started to get a little closer to the summer and we were still in the budget process. Um, the governor had released a four phase plan to get everything back open. We made it to phase three in October, which was later than anticipated. That was supposed to be in June. Um, and then he reverted us back to uh, what he called phase 2.1, which we're currently in. And um, I don't think his 
next phase on the 19th has a has a number next to it, but it's uh, it's pretty much phase three as written. Uh, so those are the Penfield revenues. Happy to take any questions on those if you have. Okay. Uh, Parks and Recreation. Anthony, Anthony, yeah. sorry, sorry, my apologies. How many rentals does it assume for Jackie Durrell and for Penfield? That's about 125 each. 125 each. How many do you have booked right now? About half of that. Is that normal for this time of year? I would imagine it's slow, given people don't know when it's going to be open, right? Um, it's a, it's a little slow, definitely a little behind schedule, but. Um, Again, we, we have tours of the building every day and we're taking, we take rentals two years in advance. So uh, we are booking things currently. So things are- And your available. rates and your rates are holding? Yeah, we're holding the rates again. And I imagine as, as new guidelines are announced for how many people can be in and outside, <laughs> and people, hopefully you'll see an yeah. uptick. Uh, yep. Praying for it. Okay, uh, moving on to the parks and rec revenue, uh, you'll see swim lessons. Again, uh, we used a three-year average. We weren't able to have swim lessons last year, again, due to uh, state guidelines and COVID restrictions. Um, they haven't released the guidelines for, uh, officially updated guidelines for this summer, uh, but it looks like they will be allowing swim lessons. Obviously, uh, there's some legislation up at in the Capitol right now that, they're, uh, that may uh, really hamstring our um, attempt to collect revenue for swim lessons. They would like swim lessons to be offered by municipalities for free. Um, granted, this is only a $5,000 number in our budget. Um, some of the other towns around us obviously have much larger uh, swim programs, but something to keep an eye on. Uh, programs, um, this is our programming account. Um, right now we're projecting no revenue for this. Um, Again, this is primarily due to COVID. This money gets collected in uh, at the end of September, September 30th. So essentially we're collecting those now. Um, all our programs, as I'm sure you guys know, uh, camp programs, soccer programs, things of that nature are pretty much self-sufficient. Um, so we've got to build those back up in order to start turning our revenue on that. So I played it conservative here and went with, uh, with showing no revenue. If we do pull in some, great. Um, but I didn't want to guarantee you that we're going to pull in any. Again, this past, but the current budget we're in, uh, we were hoping for eighty thousand, and it was a big zero. So, uh, I'm so, so Anthony, in the past it was one hundred eighty-five thousand. For whatever reason, we brought it down to eighty last year. Um, now you're at zero. What are you doing for the cost base for these programs? So again, these these are all self-sufficient. So. Um, the, the cost to run the program typically is what it costs. We make money on our, our camp program and our, our sports leagues, our two uh, our rec basketball, which did not happen this season due to COVID. So that was a, that's a $40,000 hit alone right there. Um, and then our youth soccer, which the numbers are, are they're good, uh, but due to the amount of refunds we had to give for, give for COVID, um, we're, we, were, we were in a deficit. We're not in that deficit right now, but it's just a matter of, okay, are we we're probably going to be back to even, um, which is all our startup money. And then from there, we'll be able to build upon that again. So, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I understand why you're doing what you're doing. I guess what my question is, is on the expense side, I should be saving similar savings then, correct? No, that's not correct. There's actually no correlation. Um, the, pro, the, the salaries and stuff actually come out of the full-time salaries. These people aren't seasonal employees that typically are doing these things. Um, so again, program fees are strictly set offset by fees. So if, if we have a soccer program, uh, the fees are coming out of that, that fee, just pay the soccer referees. They're not anywhere else in the budget. They come strictly out of those program fees. No, I understand that. But if you're, you're saying that basically that those fees are accounted for in this account, you have this account at zero. Out of this account, right, you would pay then, I would guess, referees and others and other costs related to the program, right? Which that expense would need to be accounted for somewhere. So why wouldn't that be in your general operating expenses and why wouldn't your operating expenses be lower? Because it's in this account. This all comes out of our, our, our revolving fund. Oh, so you're saying that this is net. So this That's truly correct. isn't a revenue account. This is a net account. So this you're saying- 
on the programs you used to make eighty thousand dollars net revenue this year you zeroed the whole thing out that's correct all right so yeah the way the way that fund works is we have two hundred thousand dollars in that account as yep. startup money so anything over that two hundred thousand which would have been that eighty thousand so in order for you guys for me to have that eighty thousand i've got to have 280 in that account that account right. went into it went below the 200 so we are I'm hoping to get us back to that 200 by October, uh, October one. And then, like I said, we'll be able to build that account back up. So we, we're still suffering from COVID. All right. Uh, yep. Tennis concession and stuff like that. We're still able to hold these people to these contracts, even though I got to believe they've been hit by COVID. No, they, they have been, and they've all been very good about paying their rent. So yeah, these are true numbers. Okay. Yep. Uh, miscellaneous parks, again, we went with a three-year average. Um, those are just some miscellaneous things, picnic tables, uh, cones, things of that nature that um, get rented out for block parties and, and stuff like that. Um, like you mentioned, tennis concession, that's a contract. And field rentals, uh, we went with uh, the three-year average. Um, again, spring looks like spring sports are gonna happen. Fall sports um, did happen, so, um, our field rentals do, are doing fairly well. Uh, moving on to waterfront. Waterfront, you'll see our beach stickers. Um, I went with the three-year average. Again, this one is, is kind of a tricky one for us to predict with COVID, uh, but this does take into consideration the three-year average and that we're gonna be able to sell non-resident beach stickers, which we are currently doing. Um, and we're you know, as long as we're open and uh, a lot, there's no restrictions on capacity or um, residents versus non-residents, um, these numbers will be doable. Our beach parking, um, we went back to the 275, which is uh, the number that I normally am able to hit um, with a fairly good weather year. Um, obviously, if it rains, that number suffers a little. Um, very rarely do we go over it. We did have one really good year that bumped that three-year average up. Um, and then the beach concession, um, that is our Jennings Beach um, concession. So again, that that is currently under contract. So the beach part, why did we bring everything down last year, if you don't uh, remind me of the beach stickers yep. and the beach parking? Yeah, it was primarily due to COVID. Again, at the time we had- At the end, yeah. Yeah, we had, we had restrictions on yep. when non-residents could come to the beach, when we were selling daily passes, it was resident only at one point, so we weren't taking any revenue in. So that was right. Uh, this was adjusted by the other town bodies after we got done. That's why. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, marina, moving on to the marina. So now this is our second going into our second budget with the, the uh, still call it the new marina budget. Um, as far as the rates and everything went, um, nothing was increased uh, fee wise. So we're still expecting to bring in the six hundred thousand. Uh, for boat dockage, again, those are our slips. Um, Three-year average is a little high because it used to incorporate all the boat racks that are broken out below now. Um, so that's that extra 60,000 that's in there roughly. Um, winter storage um, is increasing by about $8,000 and that's because we included, um, we created a, a new summer storage um, for I think 30 something boats, if I'm not mistaken, trailers. Um, so that'll pick up some extra revenue there. And then our uh, kayak rack, sailfish, sunfish, all those uh, types of racks are below, which you'll see Penfield, Jennings, Yee, Yacht Yard, all stay static because they're all full. Um, and then our gas dock concession, his rent um, goes up by contract. So you'll see that increase there. Moving on to Carl Dickman golf course. Um, Driving range, again, we held steady. They have a small driving range there. Um, carts, same thing. They very rarely do carts get taken out there, so we kept those numbers. Um, and then you'll see the greens fees. We did go with the three-year average. Again, the uh, in a good year, we would hit these numbers. In a bad year, with rain and no interest in, or lower interest in golf, this number would be much lower. Um, but trying to take into consideration um, not knowing what COVID is going to do. If people are back at work, that number will go down. If people are still working from home, I anticipate that this number will um, be higher than this. But uh, 
the safest bet for me or the most conservative bet was to go with the three year average. Uh, Smith Richardson golf course, pr uh, primarily the same type of uh, rationale there. Um, you'll see I went with the three year averages uh, pretty much across the board um, with the exception of the locker uh, rentals. Um, that is going to significantly increase because we now have um, 86 lockers that we are able to rent out instead of 40. Um, so, and we increased the fee. The Golf Commission uh, approved a fee of $125 for the season for the full bag storage there. So, um, this is based on 60% occupancy. Um, we do anticipate those being very popular. So, I would I would guess that this number is going to be a little higher. Um, and then you'll see the concession again. Um, with uh, Boca in their steel point, um, based on their contract, they came in much higher than our last bench. So uh, we're looking pretty good there. So Anthony, um, my question here, it relates to, the, so the clubhouse is open and operational and will be for the summer, correct? That's correct. There was talk about raising fee, uh, golf fees as a result of that, isn't that correct? That is also correct. But that, but that didn't impact your average here. That is correct. Why is that? That means you're not really using the three-year average. You're lowering your number of rounds because your rate's higher. That's correct. You're absolutely right. We went up $2 per round, so I've got to assume that there's going to be some loss in the, the number of rounds. Uh, and for me to try to figure out all the the nuances between the number of residents, senior residents, non-residents, juniors, all that. For me, again, it's it's fairly easy to uh, lean back on the three-year average and, and go with that. Again, we've always carried a $1.1 $1 million historically um, revenue line here, which we rarely hit. I think this year is probably the first year we've hit it since I've been here in 15 years, uh, 17 years. So, Yeah, but what I'm thinking is that um... – you have this number because it was part of your financial analysis in order to get us to sign off on building the clubhouse. Yep. So you should take the number from your financial analysis that justify the clubhouse and it should be baked in here as your golf fee number. Cause that assumed an increase in golf fees because of the new clubhouse and because of what that brought to the table. Now I can understand tweaking that a little bit this year, given the, um, you probably aren't going to get the private, the big private things that you thought you would get to at least the whole course because of COVID. So you might not get that, but I would much rather see this aligned with the business plan that was presented than saying I just used the three-year average. I can look at that number just to double check what it was. Could you please? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't, I'm, I'm not letting you guys off the hook for that number given we just did the, uh, the clubhouse there. How's that sound? No, that's that sounds fair. Um, I know our numbers were through the roof this year, so again, I'm not I'm not overly concerned. That's awesome. Then raise it. Okay. All right. That takes care of our revenue, unless there's any other questions. All right. We'll jump over to the expense. Sorry, I just I'm curious if raising is there historic precedent to think that raising at two dollars would have a change in people's what people are willing to do. Well, that's funny. Um, yes, uh, typically. Sorry, it's to be funny. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's it, it's just funny in in the context that you know typically when you have a two dollar increase, you know I've got a line out my door with pitchforks and you know people are trying to burn the building down. Um, this year, I guess, because of COVID and the fact that the course is you know sold out every day, um, I, I haven't heard that. Right. I mean, I don't have people. I don't. I don't. I don't think I've received one email saying. Don't raise the don't raise the rate, um, and it was you know it was that con that conversation has come and gone already. So, but again, as to Tom's point, I mean we've been talking about this for several years now. I mean this this project is uh, at least uh, three years in 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 the work. So I mean we've always been talking about that two dollar increase once the club opens, and then a dollar you know every year after that or every other year after that uh, based on that business plan. So, uh, but typically when you do raise the rates, yes people you'll get less people playing okay. uh, right now we're, we, you know, we're in that upper third um, as yeah. far as non-resident rate goes. And that's primarily what we try to base our you know, gauge where our, our 
golfers are going to be coming from. You're competing with all the other municipal courses around you. Um, you know, so but we're right. We're for the most part, you know, fairly even with where where we should be. So I don't see us losing those golfers per se. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. All right. Uh, jumping over to expenses, uh, Penfield begins on page two thirty nine with the description. All right. Um, one of the things you're going to see across um, my budgets, all six of my budgets, is an, an increase in seasonal payroll. And this is primarily due to an increase in minimum wage. Uh, minimum wage goes up a dollar this year. Um, I am terrified of what next year's budget will look like because it goes up two dollars in that budget. And again, you guys have heard me talk about this because I've seen this one coming. So um, it's in here. But um, again, that the driver in our seasonal and part-time payroll rate, as you'll see. Um, everything else stayed static in this. Okay, let me take a look. So the pit, what did the rate go up by again? A uh, dollar. Dollar an hour? A dollar an hour. So if you- and that's, just... Yeah, and that's the entire increase pretty much? Yeah. Yeah, there were no there's no additional um, bodies put into this, and obviously the party attendants are in direct um, concert with how many parties you have. Correct. That is correct. Right, so it's tied to the revenue. Yep. And in terms of COVID uh, precautions and safeties moving forward, do you feel comfortable that all that is built into these numbers? Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Yeah, th those guidelines are very clear for us, so we're able to uh, to staff accordingly. And not just from a staffing perspective, but from a cleaning and. Yes, that's all. In all the that. Okay, and you feel comfortable. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, if there's no other questions about Penfield, I'm going to move on to Parks and Rec. Uh, so Parks and Rec starts on 2:42. Um, budget numbers are on 244. Um, again, there's no, there's not really any, there's a little seasonal here um, for our special needs program, our after school program. Um, outside of that, you'll see an increase in the fees and professional services line. Um, and yeah, what that is that? That increase is tied directly to our fireworks, um, our, our potential fireworks show. Um, their contract that did go out to bid last year, um, and it did come in, I think, 7,000 higher um, than it was the prior time we went out to bid, so three or four years prior to that. Um, that also makes up, it also carries, um, I believe, uh, 13,000 for uh, concerts, and then it is also our Memorial Day parade, um, about 20,000 in there. So any increases to the concerts or the Memorial Day parade, or is it just all the fireworks? Just all the fireworks. That is all firework getting. Anthony, how about getting them sponsored? We've tried. Doesn't work at all. Uh, it, it has not worked to date. Um, it's not going to stop us from continuing to try. Um, but we've, we've hit some roadblocks with that for sure. Um, one of the, you know, the, uh, United Illuminated is one of those that makes perfect sense, uh, but they don't like to sponsor these types of events. But. And it may be an opportunity to work with just putting dangling this with uh, Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development to talk about you know where there might be some some opportunities. But agree, United Illuminating, if you're listening, come on. <laughs> um, Anthony, can you tell me about the line? That says uh, the property, uh, where did I just see this? Okay. Educational memberships and then the contract, the property, contracted yeah. property services. Yep, um, contracted property services, that makes up our uh, town hall tree lighting. Um, and the guy who had done, who had lit our tree or decorated that tree for the last 30 years um, retired. Um, we put it back out to bid and this is what the lowest bid came in at. So. Um, in order for us to get that tree decorated accordingly, it, that's the cost of it. Um, the educational and memberships line increased. Uh, the, 
Did he fall off? He did. He, yeah, his internet. And I would just highlight, it's not a huge number. It's the percentage increase that I was more questioning. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm back. You're back. You know, I guess one of these lines we're going to have to put in here to, to make this internet a little better over here. Um, yeah. I apologize. Hopefully, you guys didn't hear me cursing. Um, <laughs> Nancy, I'm sorry about that. Did you? Um, it was it was not about a specific i mean the number itself contracted property services it, it's more and the um education memberships they're they're low numbers but high percentages and i was yeah. curious about that yep so the contracted property services is for the town hall uh, tree lighting um, yeah i heard that one it was the next one yep and the, the educational membership is primarily because we had a new uh, staff member and in order to get them their certifications and everything that uh, goes along with their job I needed to increase that line item. Um, as you can see, we've been over it almost every year. So it's, it's actually trying to get it in line with where we should be. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'll Excellent. move. Yep, moving right along to Waterfront, which is on page- Sorry, can I ask you what, sorry, I do have one question. In the case, sure. and it may be a little, Random, is there space in this when you have someone who wants to do a town program, like a camp or a tennis, whatever, and then just economically it's not viable? Are there programs or supports in place that allow for that? Yes, um, depending on what, uh, yes and no, depending on what the program is and what the demand is. If it's a, if it's a one-off program, um, you know, I don't want to pick on any specific program, um, but if it's a program that just, you know, Nancy Lefkowitz wants because she thinks it's going to be fantastic, but nobody wants to register for it, we may try doing it. And if it fails miserably, we won't do it again, um, or we'll try to come up with an alternative way to offer it. Um, if it's a program like our, our, our adaptive programs, our special needs programs, you know, we, we charge very little for those programs, but we carry them in our budget to offset. Um, because they have, a, they bring a lot of value to the town. So it, it it depends. I'm sorry, I didn't really answer that youth, question. Yeah, it? well, not really. So like youth soccer, for instance, and and you know, this is a work in progress. So I don't mean to put you on the spot. It's okay. Um, if someone wants to participate but can't afford the fees, that we have in place now. Okay. We we, we build that into our program fee, uh, a certain number of what we call scholarships uh, for each one of our. Parks and Rec programs, not a contracted program, but a program that we run. So our summer camps, we work with the Senior Center and Social Services to offset those costs. We work with all three uh, middle schools. Again, they typically um, have some funds that they can help offset those costs too. Um, and, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, 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 go ahead. I was just saying, and so it's based on expressed need. And, and second, do you have a, an idea of how many people do participate? in those need-based scholarships and it's not relevant you know to passing your budget or supporting your budget but it'd be something i'd be curious about down the road yeah no i i know the number for summer camp off the top of my head um we typically do about four thousand registrations for summer camp and we normally have in the neighborhood of about 60 scholarships um either free or half uh, scholarships okay thank you yep you're welcome all right, um, moving on to Waterfront. Um, waterfront, again, is on 247, and the uh, numbers are on 248. Um, so seasonal payroll, again, I'm chalking this up to a increase in minimum wage. Um, we have about 85 lifeguards that work for us, 20-something um, parking attendants. Again, that's where all these uh, people get paid out of here. Um, so you do see an increase there. Um, we also have the skate park attendant included in this right now. 
which I don't believe was in last year's budget because it was supposed to be leased out, but it is back in the budget. So that's also part of the driving uh, increase here. Um, outside of that, the most part, everything else stayed the same. Um, you will see, I did put um, $500 extra in for uh, maintenance and repairs. Again, that this is primarily for uh, lifeguarding equipment, rescue equipment, or any repairs um, that need to be done. And there is a capital outlay line in here that I don't normally put in here unless we need something. And I had put in for a, uh, an ATV um, for our lifeguarding staff. Right now, when our lifeguards uh, have an issue, say at Jennings Beach, uh, the Penfield guard, they'll leave a skeleton crew at Penfield. The other half of them will jump in their cars, drive through the neighborhood to get over to Jennings Beach to help with the search or whatever type of emergency we have. Um, with an ATV, they'd be able to go right down the beach. And um, it just seems like one of those safety things that we should be investing in. So I threw it in the budget. Uh, and that's why that one doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, it feels like a great thing. But can you go back two pages? Um, the 150000 did we talk about that, the master plan? We did not talk about that. We Could can you? talk. Could you? <laughs> L love an, a ten thousand dollar ATV. I just don't know what this master plan thing is. Yeah, so the master plan I presented to uh, the board of selectmen a few weeks ago through the capital uh, non recurring capital project. Um, you guys passed it, if I'm not mistaken, uh, unanimously. It went to the board of finance. Um, they voted it down three to five, um, and basically said they didn't support funding a plan into the capital project so they didn't uh, want to bond it they didn't right. they didn't want to bond it so they suggested putting it into the operating budget so here it is got it okay i wanted to i didn't understand if that's what we had seen and it's just coming back our way in this yes. vehicle okay yep i apologize for glossing over it no no it's okay because i was there when we voted for it i just didn't know we were seeing it again yeah any other questions on waterfront no, I'm actually good. So, okay. Anthony, you're going to have two vehicles down there. One of them is going to be DPW that they want for the garbage and stuff like that, which I assume is a replacement vehicle. And then the other one's this new ATV, right? That's that's correct. Theirs is a replacement vehicle. There's one down. There's a garbage vehicle down there now. Right. And you're going to tell us the same thing on the marina that it's all related to uh, seasonal payroll. Is that right? Or that is correct. Um, and then there is, there's a capital outlay in there as well. Uh, so the capital outlay in the marina is for 60,000. And this is part of a bigger project that I believe you'll see in some other budget, uh, specifically the IT budget, I think, um, where they're going out for security cameras. Uh, so the, the thought was to try to jump on that same package and install security cameras, which has been on the the plan for the marina for uh, a few years so just to increase the security down there and just so people on the on uh watching this or listening to this know we have had some incidents down at the marina of boats broken into and things of that sort have we not we have yes how many have we had do you know anthony i don't know that number off the top of my head but i'm sure the police can give me a report on it can you just do that just so that we yeah. have that at the ready i'm sure the other town bodies will ask for it as well Absolutely. And who's going to monitor those those cameras? How's that going to work? Yep. Where so, gonna... yeah, um, pretty much all the new security cameras that get installed have uh, remote access to pretty much any a desktop anywhere you know that has internet access. So our marina manager, our marina coordinator, will have access to them, as will the marine police. Um, so they would be monitored uh, regularly, as opposed to going back and trying to figure out what happened. I would assume they also have record functions too, correct? That is correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all right. Um, next up are the two golf courses and I'll start with Carl Dickman on page 254. Numbers are on 255. All right. Um, so again, you're going to see um, seasonal payroll increase. Here at Carl Dickman, I actually did put in for an extra position um, 
that is uh, an extra maintenance position. Um, so that's primarily why this jump is. Yes, it, there's minimum wage increases as well, but this one is significantly larger because it has an additional position in it. Uh, so I didn't want that to get lost. Uh, with the increased amount of play we've had during COVID down there, um, we need to keep up with the maintenance. Um, again, we're anticipating this spring and summer that we're gonna have the same type of play that we've had you know, for the past year or so uh, at R3. Our plan is to increase pro junior programming down there, senior programming. Um, so we are really trying to utilize that course uh, to its full capacity. Um, the other large driver in this, um, this budget is the capital outlay. Again, you guys typically will see us put capital outlay for the two golf courses when we need equipment. Um, so there is a, a Greensmaster mower in here. There's some topsoil and um, one other mower that make up that total of the 62,000. Uh, do you need to do both mowers this year? If Peter is on, I believe Peter is on here. He could just chime in. He knows how to can unmute. <laughs> I am unmuted. There you go. I hear you now. Nice. Well, uh, well I, I, the question was, do we need two mowers down there? Yes. Do we need to replace both this year? Uh, I, actually, I, I, the, way I'm, the way things are going, I'm looking at replacing one up here and one down there. Um, we haven't gotten any new equipment in the last two years. Actually, I haven't have gotten any new equipment up here in four years. But uh, if it's, things are things are starting to break down and getting old here. So uh, if you have to ask me, yeah, I, I think we do need them. All right. What's the uh, the overtime earnings? Why did it go up so much? The overtime in the season. I'm just looking at a percentage basis. It doesn't look like that's all rate. So is there more volume there? I, I'm my apologies. I stepped away for a second. You might have said it's because of the number of rounds or something. It is because of the number of rounds down there. Um, that is primarily the driver there. We have one full time employee that um, on the maintenance crew down there, and he gets those overtime hours on the weekend. So um, that's where they're coming from. Got it. Can I can I jump to a Smith Richardson related expense? Yeah, we can, or we can jump we can jump right over there. Yeah. Well, um, Mr. Grace brought up something that had been brought to my attention um, last week about a mechanic, and I just want to make sure that we're not being having just invested so much of the town's uh, money and resources to this beautiful golf course. I just want to make sure we're not, you know, proverbially shooting ourselves in the foot. I asked a bunch of golfers about this and someone made the analogy of it's like supporting buses, but not the gas to make them run. And so that just struck me. And so um, while I understand Mr. Grace is graciously trying to make do and, and see, I just want to make sure for the record, we're stating that, you know, we're not being penny wise pound foolish here, especially for a, an asset that more than pays for itself. That being so the golf course. Just jump in, Nancy, this is part of our reorganization plan and we uh, we looked at this closely and I uh, consulted with Anthony as well closely and we feel that we can cover this with sending uh, our, our equipment out for maintenance. We have included money in the budget to do that and it does save a significant amount uh, because it's not a full-time staff with all the benefits as well. So we're going to give this a try. We think we think it's going to work. And you know, like I said to um, a couple people asked me about it was, you know, you're never going to know uh, if you can change things if you don't at least try. So this is an this is an idea that I think will work, and we're going to give it a shot. And if it doesn't, we'll come back. But I, I'm pretty sure it's yep. going to work. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I'm unmuted, okay. Um, all right, so onto the, the Smith expenses outside of the regular payroll. Um, again, seasonal payroll is increasing because of minimum wage. So you see those two increases. Um, a big percentage jump that I see is in the uh, 
uh, motor vehicle fuel. And again, I, I heard you uh, guys speak to that earlier. Again, that's a formula where we just type in the amount of um, gallons and it, it gives finance the number. So um, based on our usage, that's the number that would be the increase. Um, communications, I increased that line. Um, we have a new golf pro up the golf course. I want to try to support him um, in his marketing ventures um, as best we can to try to, to continue to ride the wave um, that we've had up there uh, with more people playing. So that's where that increase is. Um, cleaning janitorial, again, um, with, the, with the new building, larger building, COVID protocols, we had to increase that line um, just to make sure we have enough supplies. Uh, and then we increased our special department supplies by about $5,000, uh, primarily for the same reasons. Uh, everything. What's, a, then, what's the fees and professional services what keeps going up each year? Um, so fees and professional services, well, it went, <laughs> so it actually, this is the line that uh, Brenda was just referencing. This line yeah. has our golf pro in it, um, yep. which makes up roughly 160,000 of it as opposed to the old lines where it was almost 100 and 190,000. Um, but then they they added 30,000 on top of that uh, to help offset the cost of not having the mechanics. So if we need to bring the mechanic up, that, this is where that those fees are. Right, so it's essentially outsourcing it in some ways. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and then the capital outlay is the only uh, is the is the large, the largest driver of this budget here. Um, and is that one sprayer? This is one sprayer. That's correct. The current sprayer, I believe, is upwards of twenty something years old. So, and we we put this one in in the past too, and it's been cut. So, <laughs> it's back. Right to Mr. Grace's standpoint, we haven't spent in, I mean, very very little on capital outlay here yep he's also got to like the fact that on here his position is listed as super golf course <laughs> it's a super golf course yeah exactly <laughs> hello mr flynn i know your son works on a golf course and uh <laughs> he did that's I, true <laughs> ask, ask, ask him about the mechanics position very important but i'm not going to go there right now okay i will i actually will any other questions that you guys have? That is uh, everything that I've got. Great. I'm good. Okay. As am I, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grace as well. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Right. Grace. Thank you, Anthony, very much. Um, okay, we're going on next to information technology with David Kelly, who's been the man of the year. Making sure we're all able to continue to meet during this global pandemic, and Dave has stretched himself um, every which way. So thank you, Dave. You're up. All right, hello. hello. Uh, am I on the air? Yes, it's, I am. It's page okay. 156, everybody. All right. So uh, uh, the information technology budget uh, covers mostly contracts for centrally shared systems and software. Our three largest items are the town share of Munis, the Microsoft software licensing, uh, and the uh, town-wide fiber optic network that connects all of our 20-ish sites together. Uh, something that's a little different this year is we have a perfect storm of a whole bunch of multi-year contracts expiring at the same time. And by whole bunch, I mean our town wide area network contract and our uh, Microsoft agreements. Usually we uh, sign three to five year agreements on those and we have very predictable pricing for those three to five years. Well, this year both have come up for renewal and we have a uh, uh, we, we, I'm estimating that there will be some kind of an increase in cost after the prices having been held steady for three and five years. Uh, I also have a couple of smaller items that I've added in that are basically going incremental 
operational costs. Uh, that is, um, as you may know, right now we have uh, at the beginning of, uh, of a project to install a uh, land use permitting and inspection system in town. Uh, we've just sent our first load of data from our legacy systems off to our cloud vendor. Um, and we expect that project to take roughly a year to complete. However, uh, a, in the, such a system does not account for every kind of form or data that we have in town that we want to digitize and put online. Uh, so uh, added into the software line, uh, an estimate based on a product we've seen to install an online electronic forms system so that a lot of the uh, existing paper processes that we have where uh, a resident needs to download a scanned form from a website, fill it out, scan it, and send it back or mail it back. Instead, we'd like to electronify that whole process. Um, another uh, incremental increase is in the communications line in addition to a potential increase in our uh, annual cost for that, because again, we're uh, renewing that contract. Um, is the addition of some additional security mechanisms on the town's internet line to better protect it from ever-evolving security threats. And lastly, I've added a small item into capital outlay uh, to take ownership of uh, security camera systems that we've talked about uh, or I've heard talked about earlier. Uh, the town has a number of different brands and flavors and ages of security cameras in, uh, at various facilities. Many of them are from vendors that are no longer in business. Um, some of them are failing and I'd like to, I don't see that anybody in town actually owns uh, most of these security cameras in town, so I'm suggesting that IT take them on and uh, we will treat them like any other network device that the department supports. Uh, I would encourage us not to be sharing which ones <laughs> to make sure there's no That's, issue. That is correct. I'm keeping my, holding my tongue on that. So let's go from the top though. If we look at IT software, the, dri the driver there of the 19% increase is exactly what? Uh, that's the online uh, electronic form software that I'm proposing is most of that. Uh, and this I do is- expect to see and this is kind of like you can electronically sign it as opposed to having it down. This is like DocuSign and that kind of thing, Dave? Something like that. We've uh, looked at a product that's used commonly in municipalities that that does all of this online. There's no more scanning or any of that stuff. So give us give us an example of a, a form right now that that would be prevalent. Te you know, give me the elevator pitch. What, what process do I need to interact with the town where I can just do this online? Is it my park and recreation sticker? Is it my, you know, I, I rent a kayak slip? Is it that? What is it? This is to scrape up everything that's not already in the parks and rec system, that's not already in the permit inspection system. Um, so uh, parks and recreation, they do a lot of that online in their rec track, uh, in their uh, rec track system. Uh, Online permits and inspection type stuff will be done in our new permitting land use and inspection system. But there's lots of little forms of various kinds. Uh, you go to any town, any town department's website, you'll see things that are just not, they fall between all the cracks. They're not part of a larger system. So, so give me a hard answer, like it, dog licenses oh. or something like that. Just give me examples. Okay, there, okay uh, there is one. There, there you go, dog licenses. <laughs> That's a good example. There are several things in the town clerk's uh, department that uh, we could put online less paper oriented, you know. Uh, and I'm not looking to just, you know, electronify a paper process. The idea here is to go completely electronic where the data is actually received in a back-end database rather than receiving an email or receiving a form as a form. Right, right, that's what I thought. Okay, fees and professional services, up 3% to 220, um, but what is that? Um, estimating an increase in our uh, munis expense, we do munis year to year now. Uh, we used to be able to get them, do munis on a three or five year agreement, but they no longer do that. Why is I that? Estimated, do you know? Uh, 
Well, if you were a vendor, would you want to lock yourself into a, a set price for three to five years? And yeah, it's, it, yeah. In in it some ways, a yeah. More wiggle room to to increase. And I just uh, looking at my notes here, I predicted about a four percent year over year increase. Are they? Um, is there any concern that they are moving away from this, or that we need to upgrade their system, et cetera, et cetera? We're pretty well tied to them. Do you have any concerns on that right now? Not really, um, mm -hmm. and we are up to date. I mean, they we routinely follow their upgrade paths and so on. So it's not like we're falling That's behind good. or anything like that. Um, I've heard, I think, in this board as well as the board of finance in the past discuss well. Would you ever consider moving away from this vendor? And of course, if something terrible happened, we we might do that. But as Very we, as is often discussed, there's a high barrier to exit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The MBA exactly. term for that one. So uh, yes, it's a, it's not the cost of the software year to year. It's the migration cost that yep. that'll get you. So as long as they are, you know, reasonable in their increases, and generally software vendors go up faster than inflation, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, it, it takes a bit of, you know, they, they're trying to keep the business, of course, but uh, uh, yeah, if I were them, I wouldn't want to lock into, you know, three or five years again either. Mm. Uh, <laughs> What's in like, communications? I'm sorry? Communications went up 20 grand. Communications. communications. That you said is the security, right? Is that the, uh, um, the anti-hacking? Yeah, the... Yes, yes. Um, you know, we, we have security, some security mechanisms in place now. I don't want to go into deep detail on that in, in a public forum. But, uh, you know, it's an ever-evolving war out there where you're always uh, trying to up the ante and improve well, your security mechanisms. Yeah, particularly if you're trying to go more online with your forms and things like that, so that just makes yeah, sense. Yeah, well, I'm trying to trying to protect the town as best yeah. we can, and and uh, you know we're we're doing things very well, I think, but uh, we really need to keep upping the ante uh, to keep the bad stuff out. Well, there's been a, a lot of my clients, and this year has been a prodigious year for hacks. Uh, and ransomware and the like. I mean, it's been all over the place. Yep. Uh, yep. The um, I, I'd be interested in your capital outlay. Is this part of a okay. multi-year plan? Capital outlay, as as defined here, it's just maintenance. I uh, use capital outlay to continually cycle out PCs, laptops. Uh, uh, net, uh, server parts, uh, network parts, and printers. Uh, that's basically been a flat number right along. PCs, prices aren't going up or down all that much. They've kind of stabilized. Same thing with laptops. Printers have gone down slightly, so I've lowered my, in, you know, what we're actually spending on printers has gone down, the actual Got mechanical it. devices. So uh, I've slightly reduced that over the past couple of years. And, uh, but most of what appears to be an increase in the capital outlay this year is really just restoring my flat maintenance budget as because we, uh, we uh, halved it last year. That's it. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you for keeping us all connected this year. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Amen to that, Dave. Thank you much, Dave. All right. We are now on to human services. We're half, we're a little more than halfway through. Uh, we're on to human services with Julie DeMarco. Um, I think she called, is she, Julie, are you yep, on, I'm on the line? phone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yes, Perfect. absolutely. Yep. Here I am. You have the floor, Julie. And what page is this? 224. Um, 224. Yep. So we're a relatively easy budget compared to what you've been addressing today. Um, our largest expenses are people expenses between payroll and um, Social Security. Our fees and professional services is for lunches and for um, exercise instructors. The only two areas that we have changed right now really are, are Social Security, the motor vehicle 
fuel and lube advertising we've bumped down to 500 because um, we just we just don't really advertise very much with paper or with with sending things out that cost money because we do so much online now and same with postage we cut that down we do do a mailing or two a year or use that for social services to uh, mail documents that can't be done electronically but we don't do as much mailing and we do not mail our newsletter so that's pretty much it for human and social services love to take some questions if you have them I'm pretty good actually so thank you yeah hope you hope you're well super easy yeah I'm doing great yeah me too thank you for everything you've done to you know care for this community and some of our most vulnerable during this crazy crazy time it's been our pleasure Absolutely. I just want to uh, piggyback on Nancy's comment. Julie has really stepped up above and beyond um, working with CERT, working with Operation Hope, working with volunteers to, to reach out to our homebound seniors, to people who need help, delivering food, setting up all kinds of programs, caller-friendly programs. I do mention a lot of this um, in my newsletter, but I want to publicly say that, you know, Julie, you have been a real treasure to our community during this pandemic, and I, I just personally want to thank you very much. Thanks. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everything, Julie. All right. Have a lovely afternoon. All right. You All too. Right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. We're on to, uh, so the next one is conservation. Um, obviously, uh, we've had some uh, changes. Uh, as we know, we lost the director of conservation, and um, due, due to the reorganization, uh, of the, the, the assistant position uh, was eliminated. <clears throat> we are currently in the process of, uh, of searching for a new director. The position that was eliminated on, in the budget is going to be uh, pulled into the director position and some of that responsibility will also be handled by the inland wetlands compliance person who was part-time and who is now going to be full-time in the conservation department. In the interim, uh, while we are uh, down staff, I have uh, brought in a group. I don't have my note in front of me. It's SSLR. <clears throat> they are a, a, a renowned environmental group, and they do this. Um, they handle this, this work for towns that do not have a conservation department. Uh, they also assist towns in a whole host of other environmental issues. They are well known, and I can send the information to both of you so that you can have it. But they are going to fill the gap in the interim until we can get fully back to staff, uh, fully staffed in the conservation department. And we also have an attorney um, who's been assisting with our conservation issues over for several, more than several months, maybe six months, who's also going to step up and help. And I've been in contact with the Conservation Commission chairperson, and that uh, chairwoman has been in contact with the attorney that is assisting us in conservation issues and is also going to be working closely with this company that's going to assist with all the permits and reviewing all the current things that are on their docket. So there won't be any lapse in service or anything like that. Sorry, what page did you say this was? I'm sorry. <clears throat> 71. 71, Nancy. S 71, okay. Um, I would just, you know, there's not too much to add given everything you've just said. Um, I have gotten a lot of concerned phone calls um, about conservation in particular. Um, and I, w I hope that in the coming weeks, the Conservation Commission can also uh, work with the sustainability group here who's made so many great strides. And I know they've had a lot of things to say and just some questions. So I hope that there's a forum for them to be able to ask and to participate in um, some of the issues that we face. Uh, but I hear what you're saying and I look forward to hearing what that group, that outside group um, has to say, and, and thank you for sharing that information. And please feel free to direct anyone who has any questions at all to me. I'm happy to discuss it anytime over the phone. Yeah, and and I do. I just think for some people, you know, as a first line of contact, um, 
and, and I think in part people were waiting to hear you know what happens in this process but we'll also be interested to know about this outside group coming in and and that's good information and and would love to know more perhaps even before our next meeting if possible our voting meeting on monday oh next monday yeah is it possible to learn more about them at least in the information yeah i mean i'm happy to send you information about them after today uh you and yeah. tom bold yeah and then if you have any follow-up questions, happy to answer them on Monday. Yep. I don't have any for today, though. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Nancy. Is Tom, where's Tom? I'm here. Do you have anything, Tom? Yeah. Talk about the inland, talk about the wetlands compliance officer, please. And just talk about you, you move them from part-time to full-time. Yes, when we lost our director, um, I had asked her, she's been with us for a while, she's very good, she has all the necessary qualifications, and I asked her if she would step up her hours to assist the department with the absence of the director, and she did. And then during our reorganization, um, we, we thought it made sense to move her to a full-time position because she could pick up some of the responsibility of um, uh, what what is it called? The what uh, conservation administrator coordinator, coordinator. coordinator position, um, and and the director could pick up the rest of it. Yeah, the um, I wanted to to comment just to provide some context on this department. I can understand, and Nancy, you had said you received some phone calls uh with some concern over this uh, number one i think on the wetland side uh, moving it to a full-time position uh makes a lot of sense and it has been something that had been um spoken about or requested in years past number two as i recall and maybe mr bremer if you have the information i, I don't know if you have it at hand but um we had done some benchmarking gosh for a number of years of our conservation department and the staffing of that department um, as compared to other conservation departments around the state. And as I recall, and it's been some time, um, it always came up that the conservation department was a, a bit overstaffed as compared to the benchmarking uh, that had been done. So the fact that there was a, a position lost here is, is not a, um, a surprise in that regard. I do think it does make sense to have uh, some information available about that outside firm that you referenced that is coming in to help administer it, uh, just to put some minds at ease. And it would be great to get this, uh, the director position filled here uh, expeditiously if possible. But, but most certainly what's more important than doing it quickly uh, is doing it with the right the right person. I think we can all agree on that. So um, not much of a surprise uh, based on what I'd known from prior years here, but I do think um, Chris communication plan to the public would probably set some minds at ease. That That's what I would say. Absolutely. And again, you know, in this public forum, uh, anyone ha who wants to have has any questions before I have time to put together a meeting for on the whole reorganization plan, is welcome to call me at any time. But yes, we we're, we're have a firm that actually is gonna help us, assist us with a conservation director position. It is a specialty position. We want the most highly qualified person that we can get. And the, uh, then that, uh, that group will present uh, candidates to the Conservation Commission and they will choose uh, someone from there and then I have to approve <laughs> it. But, uh, by no means should anyone in the public think that we're diminishing the conservation efforts of the town. We're just being more efficient in our departments. And, and, and as Tom Flynn said, um, it, that our conservation department was uh, heavily staffed. And we, we did do those comparisons with other towns as well. And just based on my work here over the last year and watching, uh, I'm quite sure we can handle everything we need with what we're planning to do there. The sorry with what you just said, I actually um, want to make it, you know, sort of state for the record that while we may be looking to other towns, certainly Fairfield historically set the standard for what the conservation department is, and um, 
in speaking with folks on the sustainable task force and other people invested in, in these issues of conservation. I know that the conservation department supported five different um, commissions, um, including conservation, harbor management, inland wetland, land acquisition, shellfish. So I just think that moving forward, I wanna make sure in the larger plan, we're not sort of shooting ourselves in the feet, so to speak, because it has been such a standard bearer and the work has been um, so robust out of that, historically out of that department. Um, so that's just one statement, but second, do, am I correct? Is there a lawyer working on some of the conservation issues in addition to this outside consultancy? Yeah, and well, we had, so we have town attorneys that assist in all different areas. We have town attorneys okay, so that assist HR with labor issues. We have but not an out okay. work appeals, and we've had a town attorney before any of the changes who assisted on uh, conservation issues and who has been asked to step up and assist them and the department has his information is working with him directly as is the conservation commission and this is a attorney that has land use experience and conservation uh, experience okay all right i'm going to move on now to um uh, community and economic development is Mark Barnhart on the line. There I you. am. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good. How are you? Long day. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it has been. <laughs> um, all right. Well, you're up. What page? Uh, I believe it starts on page 90. Well, so the, the numbers are on 91. Right. Sorry. So there are uh, really three, three changes of, of note to speak to. Um, obviously, the biggest one is the fact that uh, we're requesting $60,000 in the capital line to upgrade the town's uh, website, uh, the official town website. So that is not exclusive to this department, obviously, uh, but it is something that uh, should be done periodically. It's been, uh, I believe, seven years since our last upgrade. Uh, so again, requesting funds for that purpose. The other two changes, while it doesn't have a um, monetary or financial impact, we are looking to upgrade the skills of our administrative support position. Uh, we do have a, a vacancy at the present time that the incumbent um, position um, has been out uh, for an extended period of time on medical leave and recently uh, was separated from her employment because she's not able to return. Uh, but uh, with that, there's an opportunity to upgrade that uh, position to more of a marketing coordinator, which will allow us then, uh, as you see in the fees and professional services line, to reduce our reliance on some of our outside vendors to manage some of our social media accounts and also uh, produce uh, our economic development uh, newsletter, which has been on hiatus, uh, given the absence of, uh, of some folks here. Uh, so, uh, with outside of the, um, the capital request, it's really a slight reduction year over year in terms of our operating budget request, uh, from, from the current year about, um, you know, less than, uh, uh, about $12,000 or 4%. So I'm happy to, uh, take any questions that the members may have at this time. Nance, do you want to go ahead? Go ahead as I'm getting my bearings. So go ahead, I'll refer you for a <laughs> Sure, so, so if you guys identified a firm that you want to use on the, on the website redesign? We have not, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge. I, I hope not to, uh, to be leading that effort. <laughs> Who would, that's, that was actually, Mark, going to be my next question is, who is going to lead the effort? You know, I, I think it would probably be a team, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it hasn't yet been identified. Perhaps out of the, the first black woman, we'll have some input into that or uh, further direction. Yeah. But, you know, we'll be happy to take part. I just wasn't uh, necessarily volunteering to lead the effort. Yeah. Uh, Brenda, do you, do you have an idea who's going to lead the effort? My chief of staff. Jackie. Got it. How did you guys come up with the amount of 60 grand? Well, we wanted, we want a 
to attract talent, um, and we're redesigning this position to have a little bit more marketing um, experience to assist Mark, because we want to be boosting and working on economic development in a more uh, strategic way. So you're talking about the, the website. I think she. Oh, I think that Tom was talking about the website, which I believe was based on uh, what it cost some neighboring towns to do this to this work, as I recall. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah, so exactly. is the, so is the goal here to build the website? Um, Chief of staff will, will be largely responsible for the day to day with this. Working with Mark and the first select woman, I would think, because part of this is economic development. Absolutely. And then this website would be maintained by the marketing coordinator on a go forward basis. Is that the goal here? I think we'd have to suss that out a bit more. But it would either be Jackie or it would be the marketing person. It would be it would be somebody within the two departments. Or we two do. Offices. In, yeah, currently, um, you know, we do have uh, a couple websites that we do maintain, so it wouldn't be a reach for the marketing coordinator to help oversee the town's website as well. Currently, we rely upon Mary Mao and the library to be our webmaster. Uh, so right. that, that would be a change in that regard. Is this is this when we talk about website redesign? I just want to make sure I understand um, the overall concept. As far there's the town website, right? And and I get that it's a bit clunky, and sometimes you know it's got the minutes manager and the agendas and all that garbage on there. I get it. Um, and then Park and Rec has its own website, and the library has its own website, and you know, police and fire, I'm not sure, but I'm sure they have a presence. Is is the goal here to bring this more cohesive? And is this, as yeah. opposed to just a yeah. redesign, is this also a yeah. web strategy? Yeah. It is a I, web strategy. Something that became really obvious when we came in, that everybody has their own website and we're not, we're not integrated with one another. And so that is the long range plan is for us to all be integrated together so you're not going to one site for police, one site for uh, Mark, one site for this. And, and our, our website, you know, you say it, it's very clunky. Um, it's, it's not helpful. It, it makes it really difficult for the public to find anything. Uh, it's not easy to use. It's not a user-friendly website. And so that is the plan to make it more interactive and easy to use and then integrate all the other town departments so that we're all, you know, it's like one-stop shopping. Yeah, I would. In order to do that, I definitely would encourage. First things first, it's got to be a cohesive strategy before you start just redesigning and launching a new website. Okay. And I know th that's kind of the sexy part of it. And I think the other other thing to bear in mind is you have to always you always have to think about who you're talking to, who is that's your audience, right. and mm -hmm. what you what message you're trying to get across. So. It may be necessary, for example, to keep some external websites if they're a distinctly different audience than the existing resident base, which is what the Fairfield uh, website should be focused on. But uh, well, Mark, I, I agree. Is it doesn't make sense because it's just adding clutter. Yeah. So, so uh, Reader's Digest version. I worked. I was a CFO for a company called About.com, and that's exactly what we did. We had a home page that you could enter through the town of Fairfield, and that's your home page. And then you had different storefronts, which were very specific mm -hmm. to park and rec. But the key to it and the efficiencies behind it was all the back end technology and hosting and all the tools were all you Seamless. were all the same. Right. Well, they were all the same so right. that it was easier to maintain. It was cheaper to maintain. It was very efficient. The look and feel was very similar, at least in the in the skeletal bones, mm -hmm. even though each area, to your point, would see a different audience um, and, and might, you know, look a little bit. The look and feel might be a little bit different, but I just want to that's a big undertaking. And I would just say that that's. That's probably the most important part is to get that part set right. And if you do that, the design and, and, and all that just kind of falls into place. Um, not only is it better customer service, but it's it's much more efficient to maintain um, f for the organization as a whole. So I, I would really encourage this to be about the web presence strategy uh, before it's just the redesign. That's, that's kind of my soapbox, uh, you know, 
Absolutely. Okay. Is there any further questions? I'm supportive of that, and I would like to make sure that that's integrated with the work that Dave Kelly's doing uh, on both security as well as the forms. I think that's, I think we have a real opportunity here, Brenda, to drive the efficiencies and the customer service that you're talking about if, if this is uh, done very deliberately and very thoughtfully. Yes, we've been working with uh, Dave on this, and this has been an overall strategy we've been working on since I came in. So everybody's been talking and, and, and strategizing and collaborating on this for quite some time. So we're looking forward to seeing it happen. And I would just echo, if we have a beautiful, robust, user-friendly website and maybe a mural or two in town, Mark, <laughs> you and I can high five and call it a, call it a day. You bet. All right. Let's uh, move on to. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Thank Fair you, Mark. TV. Let's move on to Fair TV, and I believe the commission uh, chair Stu Stu is on. <clears throat> what page? On? Page fifty-two. Are you on the line? Okay, you want to you want to talk a little, Jerry? What page? What page? Fifty-two. Who's on? Yeah. No, you can continue on. Jerry has this much better than I do. Uh, I had trouble getting in. I, my line kept being muted. But, uh, uh, well, basically. Could I jump in uh, with a question? To... Um, the fees and professional services, I hear you, Jerry, in terms of the, the increase and, and bringing things up to a more competitive what accounts for the other items under that? It's a single line item, but am I? More, more meetings, more. Uh... Right, more meetings, more personnel. Um, and certainly I appreciate that as we've all tried to stay connected and thank you for all of that. I just wanted to uh, have it stated for the record. Understood. Right. And basically that and basically that's 
the amount of basically it's the amount of bandwidth that is needed. HD is needs more than SD, and the cable companies refuse to give us more bandwidth, which is why we do everything in HD, but we have to broadcast in SD. Capabilities, yeah. So, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, for all the work and effort. Obviously, during the pandemic, uh, the value of Fair TV has has stood out. Um, I think that going forward, it's 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 become an integral part of our government and part of transparency. Uh, the biggest concern I we've always had with Fair TV, at least. Um, that I've seen in the past has actually been sound quality. And I, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing to, to deal with the sound quality. Um, but, you know, I, I would encourage you to explore what those opportunities are. And quite frankly, it's become so important. Come back to us and let us we know have. that. We have. Okay. We have, we've investigated this many times and we're hamstrung in that a lot of the people have no idea how to use the microphones that are put in front of them and the uh the sound quality is bad because again we're on an sd feed so the sound quality is not as good as an hd feed and we're we're helpless to the cable company but the biggest problem is that most of the people that, that are using the system have no idea how to use the system go ahead so jerry i think you wanted to say something Yeah.
Good. Thank you. Hey, I don't need to go through this anymore with the budget, but thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that. I look forward to getting back live and seeing it for myself. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. All right. Well, I thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for uh, being on. And I'm going to move on now to uh, the next item. I just want to be uh, cognizant. We are at 410, and we had said we were going to stop at 5. So if we could be much more laser focused on the budget and uh, just related items, that would be much, that would be very helpful. Um, All right, so thank we're you. Next up, uh, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Stu. I appreciate you calling. Uh, next is Dave uh, K with uh, Tax Collector. So, Dave, you're up. Page number. Page number, guys. Uh, One fifty. One fifty. Go ahead. Hello. Dave. Dave, you're on mute. You see the mute button there? You have to click it. <laughs> Thank you for playing our game. Um, Dave Kelly, are you on there? Do you think something's wrong with it? Maybe Fair TV shut him off. How's that? Dave Kelly, do you have him on mute? Uh, I'm sorry, I was talking and I'm on mute. Uh, Dave K, can you hear me okay? Yeah, if you click the meeting info button at the very top of the WebEx screen, it'll pop down the dial-in number and attendee ID, and you could switch to telephone for audio because your microphone does not appear to be working. Possible to go on to an, the next item and then come back. Come back. Just, think, just thinking that. Okay. Well, Dave tries to get on. Um, we're going to go to uh, Helene. Are you on? I see you there. Helene. Yes, I'm here. Ah, hi. <laughs> All right, Helene, you're up. I'm up. Okay, we're on page um, 232. All right, for the library, the main increases you're going to see, because if you recall last year, we for COVID, we cut back on material. It was cut back on materials and part time. So we're trying. Hopefully, we're planning for a post or soon to be post COVID world. So both those lines are where we're increasing. And part time is driven by the um, increases to the minimum wage. And materials, we're going to try to work our way back so that we can cut down wait times on materials. Are you comfortable that in this, uh, the excitement of, and hello, and thank you for everything you do Hi, and the services you. you provide and all of that. Um, are you comfortable that this new budget will allow for a post COVID world where people can, when allowed appropriately use the library in the ways that they do as a refuge and a sanctuary and all the other reasons that they use this beautiful resource? 
I, I know what you're saying. I, we're trying to be smart about this because things are not gonna automatically go back to normal. So it's gonna be a phased in approach. The hours, part-time line directly affects the hours, which we know. So as we move slowly, we can increase more hours. So this is based upon being open less hours in the evening and weekends. We will be open and we are open now, evenings and weekends. So it will be less hours, but I think in the library world, it's gonna be working back slowly anyway. And we're still, we're gonna work on this balance because if one thing this has taught us and we are getting better and better at is virtual services and programming. We're making great strides. And the, the exciting thing is we're gonna figure out how to balance these both, both demands now. And which is great because I think um, the balance is the key here to not, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you, I don't have any questions. Hey, how are you? Hey, good, Tom, that, how are you? Good, thank you. Hey, fees and professional services, uh, that's gone up 18%. Can you speak to that one? Which is that one? Um, Brenda, do you wanna speak yeah. about that? Yeah, I'm gonna jump in there, Tom, thanks, Helene. Um, thank so, you. Tom, part of our reorganization yep. was yep. to reduce the janitors. I think you and I spoke about this. We did. We, uh, we had, we had a janitor uh, retire from the janitor pool for both libraries. And, you know, obviously this is what I talked about during VRIP, that it was better if people retired because you don't want to eliminate positions when people are in them, if you can help it, because it's not a pleasant thing to do. Um, so this uh, position went open and we looked at this very closely. I spent a lot of time with Helene talking about it. And we feel that we can handle this uh, the, the pickup, the extra time needed with a part-time position at the discretion of Helene when she needs that time uh, at the library. So that's so where that extra money is coming from. So it's not a part-time staff, it's a service. Well, it, it, well it, it's a service to, to the extent that it's surrounding what Helene needs. No, no, I understand that. But what I'm saying is you have it here in fees and professional services, which means this isn't somebody that's going to be paid ver via payroll or whatever. It's a custodial service that you'll bring in on an as needed basis, if I understand this correctly. Yeah, that's, we went back and forth with that. Um, you know, we, we weren't sure if it should be professional services or or a part-time person that she can rely on, and we're still kind of playing with that. Uh, okay. I'm going to see but, how it works for her. You know, Helene needs specific time uh, right. to plug in. She needs it, and I didn't want to hamstrap strap her because I wanted to give her that flexibility. Got it. So for budgetary purposes, you put it in fees and professional services for about thirty grand, but it could end up being right. in part-time payroll. It might. Depending okay. on what she needs. Yeah, no, I understand that. What's the, I, what jumped out at me here was the pay differential has just continued to skyrocket here. What's what's driving that, if you don't mind me asking? Well, the pay Where differential, again, this is planning for um, Sundays again, if we can open Sundays. Ah, so this is the actual, this is the time and a half or right. double time. Right, it, yeah, the double time. I mean, it's also the evening hours, but that's the bigger driver is the Sunday. When is this contract up? I'm not really sure. The, the uh, friend, well, do you he, know when that contract is up? He, he, Hold on. Is, when? The Thea Wait contract, minute, do you know when it's up? June 30th. Uh, I don't have 21. Yeah, because they're they're open now. Thea, um, DPW. I think so. Everything but police is open. Everything but police. Why does yeah? Here's when it's zero. They wouldn't go up at all. Well, here's a. I mean, this is this is one of the things that where we can be better at what we do. Um, we should make people's time Sunday. We should stagger people's work weeks so that you're not paying double time on on weekends. 
there should be a staff that works Monday through Friday and a staff that works Wednesday through Sunday, something like that, so that we're not paying significant pay differentials here, but rather it's when someone is hired or assigned, that's their specific specific work hours. Um, because we continue to do this, and I, and I would encourage that in the next contract that we consider staggering those work weeks and that work time in order to cover. You know that what you want is a seven day a week library. So I don't see why we shouldn't um, contractually support that. That's part of the negotiation with the union that will be taking place. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that previously and it just continues to stick out there um, when we do stuff like that. And certainly it is appropriate to have the, the libraries open on weekends, but we know that it shouldn't be considered extra time. It should be considered part of the job in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if there's not any additional questions, I'd like to move back to Dave K. Are you on, Dave? Oh, we've got library, we've got Fairfield Woods. If we do Fairfield Woods. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. It's the. Is it the exact the same? Yeah. Yeah, it's with the uh, library materials and, and the pay the differential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the part time. So you would keep both libraries. You're trying to go back to both libraries open. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure I had that right. Okay. And do you have the same custodial issue here, or is that covered? That that's covered because the person is. I have a person there. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Helene. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. Thank you, Brenda. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Dave, you're up. Can you hear me? I do. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. All right, sorry about that. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, just wanted to say that it's not often that as tax collector, I actually have good news to give, but- Sorry, remind um, us of the page. Oh, yep, I'm sorry, uh, 150, starts at 150. So um, with my budget, the uh, tip uh, there there is it's, it's basically a flat budget this year from last year. Uh, the the driving the, the driver that would generally cause an increase would be salary. Uh, everyone in my um, office is part of the union, but they have all achieved their contra contractual step increases. So from last year to this year, there is no step increases that normally would, uh, you know drive the, 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 in, the increase in my budget. Um, just going down the list here, it's page 152. Any, any questions on any of the line items? I don't actually have questions here. I do want to talk to you about revenue a little bit when you get a chance. I don't have any questions, so go for it. Um, Dave, in the, in the budget book on page three, I don't know if you have it. Um, yeah. So if you could take a look there. I want to point out two, um, two numbers and see if you have any thoughts, questions, or concerns on them. Sure. Do you, are you able to, do you have the book? Yeah. All right. Prior year taxes. Um, we have an estimate in there at $3.2 million to be collected. Uh, do you think that's achievable? Do you have any concern on that? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, so we we average around 3.3. .3, so I, I you know I don't think that's I think that's very achievable. It should not be an Great. issue. Thank you. And then we have the estimated collection rate. Uh, last year we had a collection rate of 98.61. Uh, they're budgeting a little bit lower of a collection rate this year at 98.56. Um, do you have any issue with that collection rate? And do you 
have any updated information. I know it's a little bit funky this year because the state is given that yep. kind of grace period. But do you have any issue with that collection rate or, uh, you know, where do we stand um, this I, year? Nope, I do not because, again, uh, so with, with the 98 and a half, historically, that's around what we average uh, on a typical year. Um, last year we were 97.9, but that was – Obviously not a typical year. We had a deferment in April that caused a lot of payments to be made after the end of the fiscal year. July, um, right. I can never say never, but I've been given indication from the state that, yes, the current taxes that were due January 1st are in a deferment right now. They do not anticipate deferring April 1st taxes, which means that we'll have plenty of time to collect these current January taxes that are deferred. If the April 1st taxes are not deferred, which, I've, well, again, I've been given an indication that they won't be, then we'll have plenty of time to collect the April 1st taxes before the end of the fiscal year as well. Great. So then we typically get that 98.5 rate as a result. I am, I am fine then, sir, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for dialing in. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Dave. We're going to go to uh, uh, human resources. Is uh, Jim? I thought Jim said he might come up here. Um, you want to text him, Jared? I In the meantime, what page? Eighty-seven, but I don't see him on. And... Hey, Brenda. In uh -huh. the in the in the interest of time, uh, to okay. make sure that we okay. have enough time today. Um, I would recommend that we push some of the items that relate to Jared, since he's going to be here tomorrow anyway, such as retiree benefits, um, debt service, um, to discuss that tomorrow as opposed to this evening. Well, I think we still have time, so I want to do some of this. Um... Well, we've got a lot more to go through, yes. I just don't want to rush those two discussions, quite frankly. And think that since Jared's well, going to be I, here tomorrow, I agree. I agree but know. we do have um, uh, we have Half hour. items besides the education budget. We have a, a bunch of items that also have to be discussed tomorrow. Sure. So I want to make sure. Um, okay. So while we're waiting for Mr. Hazelcamp to either arrive or uh, come on the WebEx, uh, Jared, do you want to jump on finance on your budget? Sure. Here, you want to come up here? side of our budget, of the finance department's budget, not a lot of change. Um, we have one, though, that's pretty significant, and I think was requested last year was the addition of a, as part of the reorganization, the addition of a grant coordinator um, to try to, in an attempt to maximize the uh, you know, revenue sources outside of the town and our taxpayers. So. Um, that what, what we did was put in thirty thousand dollars for that for a part-time uh, grant coordinator. You would outside of that. You have my support for the grant coordinator. This is something that's been discussed for years, and I want to ensure that we're not leaving money on the table as it relates to grants, uh, both grant tracking as well as grant applications. So I'm I'm yeah. a believer in this position. That's really the only change in our uh, budget. On the, 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 the one thing, again, um, something I've been referencing throughout today's hearings, um, and hello, thank you for your time and all your work on this. Um, something I've, I've referenced is diversity and inclusion, and I don't know if, if any of this is represented here or could be pulled from other um, line items or it's perhaps something to look at down the road, but 
I know many municipalities have a diversity and inclusion team within their human resources uh, umbrella. And I'm just wondering if perhaps that's something we could discuss if the town has an appetite for it. Uh, Sorry, or we, we, I just want to interrupt for one second uh, because we are waiting on our HR department to come up here. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, I did, couldn't see who I'm. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was thinking, yeah. moving right along. Sorry, sorry. Yep. Okay. I was so my so nose was in the book. No, no, you're you're right. And my nose was so in the book that I just didn't look up. So sorry about that. I don't have questions for no, you. No I think um, one more discussion that I'd like to have, but it could take a little bit of time. And I don't want to do that if we have others waiting right now is on investment income. I'd like to talk about that a little bit because there was some significant change year over year on that. But um, sure. we can come back to that, Jared. Like I said, you're going to be in the room. So I would rather get to somebody that doesn't need to come back. So I, we have a little bit of time. I can, uh, we can at least start that conversation. And then, uh, you know, if it's, if their response isn't sufficient, then we can uh, continue tomorrow. So go um, for it. Yep. So we, we are including a reduction because we're seeing the same this year. Um, and it, it, let me just get to the right page here. And so the problem for us now is that we're, we are not able to get the rates that we've had in the past on any of our investments, our operating fund investments. We're very limited in what we can investment invest in uh, by state statute. And so the returns that we can get, you know, to give you an example, the uh, Connecticut SIP where we were, was kind of a, a short-term investment fund, was a, my understanding, a default in somewhere where we used to keep money in the past and, uh, and still do. Um, but their rate right now is 0.07%. Um, and so, and that's what we're seeing uh, that that kind of trend across the board when it comes to uh, operating operating fund investments because we are limited to uh, government bonds and uh, money market funds. Uh, CDs, right. The returns are. Is there a, hey, Jared. Is there a calculation sheet behind this that you can just flip to me so I can take a look to, at that to just see how it was calculated? Yeah. That might be the most efficient way. Okay. If you, can, if you can flip me that and then talk to me about the change in market valuation. Market valuation is projected to decrease by 276,976. We had our, uh, one of our investments uh, companies that we work with take a look at this and do the analysis, and this is what they came back with. Um, if you could just flip me that too, I'll take a look at that. Yeah. Sure. I'll just take a look yeah. at the analysis. That's all. But because uh, I I noticed it went from a positive this year, positive three year, you know, average for three years, up a quarter million. This year it was supposed to go up three sixteen. Now I don't know where it is. Uh, obviously, and then we have it going down to negative 277. So it's a hell of a swing, and I just want to understand it. That's all. Yep, we can get that for you. Now that I'm back with the program and on the right page and in the right department, um, can I just ask a quick question? Because I remember last year the discussion of the grant coordinator. There was some talk about um, where the oversight would be in terms of what departments would, would have access to this. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed it while my head was down in human resources. Um, how do you see that sort of spreading out through departments or do you not, or can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the, this person will be under the finance department, but we're not limited to uh, grants within the finance realm. It could be um, they could be looking in uh, grants related to other departments, whether it be, you know, we, we do get uh, a good amount in terms of capital grants anyway from our engineer, in our engineering DPW area. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's one potential uh, 
benefit to having that person is to look for some of these things that may not, maybe they're not ongoing grants that we get, but they could be something where the maybe the federal government starting a new program and um, you know we want to fully take advantage of that. So that would be a good use of that person to uh, try to maximize the funding that we get for them for whether it's a bridge or I can. Or, uh, hey, Jared. I can add some color to this too, because this came up probably six or seven years ago, something like that. And it really came out from a discussion that was like, where are all the grants we applied for and what status are those grants? And it was kind of, it was all over the lot. Each of the department heads was kind of doing their own thing as they had time. So to, so to Jared's point, if they didn't have time because they were running their department on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe they missed a deadline, maybe they missed an application, maybe they just didn't know that a grant was available. In addition, after grants got applied for, there was some question of, were we following up on those grants? Did we know where they were for the project? There was no one person that was assigned to actually be the gatekeeper and the monitor to make sure that in general, we were going after all the funding sources that were available. And when follow-up questions came and the like, we were, we were completing those follow-up questions. So it was really a catch-all and to Jared's point yep. at the time, putting it in the finance department to make sure that they were kind of the, the, the cop uh, over this. Um, made the most sense and that, that yeah. again that was a number of years ago and understanding all that in some ways you've just made the case for the thing i'm about to say which is i see it's here as part-time is that are we again getting in our own way um and not having this as a full-time position as we're reimagining what the future looks like at town hall you know, I was I was wondering the same thing myself when I first saw it, and I'll just give you my perspective. This is going to be a position that's going to be easy to understand whether it pays for itself pretty darn quickly, pretty darn quickly, maybe within a year. So I think, you know, I my recommendation would be that you start it part time and then you evaluate what's going on with our grants, what's going on with our tracking how are we pacing? And then maybe you do make it full time um, after you've got kind of a track record of what the position provides. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, I think yeah Tom, we're going to be looking at that. Obviously, we want to, you know, assess it and watch it in action and see how it goes. But obviously, we can make changes on the ground and then always go to the Board of Finance and ask for a transfer. But there was so much pushback about it last year. You know, I don't want to jump in with another full-time position. I want to see how it works. And if I can show the value, and if I can show that this person is bringing in money to more than pay for their salary, I think I have a better argument going in after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other? Any other questions on either the spending or the uh, revenue finance? No, not for me. Thank you. We do, have a, we do have HR here now. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for the answers. Thank you, Jared. Okay. Thank you. Where? Uh, what page is HR, if you don't mind? Eighty-seven. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll just, uh, Pat Egan is also here, so he's going to cover um, the liability coverages and the risk management side of the budget. I'll cover the office budget, which basically is, you know, a substantial rollover from last year. Um, most of the changes, I think I actually missed this meeting last year. I was hired shortly after this meeting. Uh, yeah, lucky me. Uh, so the biggest change really is in the technology area. If you look at the, the budget related to that, um, a couple months ago, we finally got up and running live our online application system. Until then, we had paper applications. So we were able to get that um, up and running, and we're still in the process of sort of refining that. But right now, all of our applications are online. Uh, and, and the process to send those out to the departments is electronic now. Um, the other pieces of the um, 
sort of the software uh, is I'm about to purchase a skills assessment software, which on the sheet here is called Test Genius. It allows us to um, basically run assessment tests for a whole spectrum of different kinds of jobs. Um, I've used it in two other towns. It's very good. Uh, it also allows us to use it for some training purposes. And then the last piece, which has been, I guess, in the town budget for a while, is the uh, time and attendance system, which as of right now has not uh, commenced because we just haven't had time to do that. The expectation is hopefully the RFP will go out over the next couple of months and we'll select a vendor and then start to move forward on the uh, time collection um, piece. That's a uh, large project that puts two of them in two different towns. It's a, a big burden mostly on the payroll function. Uh, there's a lot of integration that occurs in those projects, um, but I certainly think that there needs to be some kind of system to collect time in the town. Uh, that's certainly a weakness we have. Yeah, the rest of the budget items are sort of not a lot of consequence, so I can answer questions sort of about the general budget. And if there's questions about uh, the liability budget, I'll have Pat come up, but I can answer any of uh, those questions. If anybody has any. I had made the comment erroneously to the finance department of a human resources question, which was just about um, diversity and inclusion and uh, the opportunities for having somebody on staff who really looks at holistically at issues of inclusion across all uh, departments and um, whether there's allowance for that in trainings or, or whatnot. So I just wanted to bring that up as either a conversation for another time, something that we could begin to discuss uh, if there was even space in some of these fees and professional services. So just curious about that. Yeah, I, I don't have any other questions. Question that I would expect that's gonna come up over the next year. You know, right now I'm actually adding, I'm, I'm down staff, so I haven't filled those positions yet. So I'm in the middle of doing that. Um, and then I know you folks are involved in the task force because I think I, I spent a, a fair amount of time talking to one of your members. I don't remember right now what her name was. Um, and you know, I think the ongoing discussion, uh, there can be assessments about whether that's things that we can do in-house, whether there's different efforts that we can make. Uh, you know, it's a little challenging. I don't directly oversee the police and fire hiring, so that's something that we have to address separately. But um, certainly it's something that can be discussed I know that you folks are going to put out a recommendation that we can take a look at. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly outreach now to a certain degree. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I'm actually hiring a recruitment firm for two of the positions is to help in that exercise. We don't really have the resources to do that. Um, and that's part of the role that they would have in that exercise. Um, excellent. Thank you. Anything else or all set? No, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've got something else. Sorry, I was on mute. IT software is going up three, over 300%. Give me the rundown on that. I, you mentioned several different systems. Can you tell me what they are? Sure. It's the three I just outlined, which is online application tracking. Uh, right how much is that? Meo. Yeah, how much? Uh, it's on there. The license is 12500 Is that a one-time license or is that an annual? That's annual. Okay. Go ahead. And then the testing software I just outlined for skills is $3,650 a year. Okay. And then there's the, it's, an estimate, it's an estimate of what the time and attendance licensing will be. That is a pure guesstimate until we put out the RFP uh, and uh, get bids back. So, and that's, uh, um, is that Kronos? It'll be, there's a series of different companies. Kronos would be Got it. the most expensive one of them, but it would be something like a Kronos that would do time collection, yeah. So, and wh where's the payback on this? Like, is it in, g give me where am I going to see the reduction in the budget for the f for all this money we're spending? And I know you well, don't I'm have sorry. it in there for this year, but where is, where am are we going to see it in future years? 
I guess I don't really understand. The question right now is we don't track it uh, in any substantial way. We don't have a system that captures time at all. So, um, you know, the capture is going to be making sure people here on time or right now they wouldn't be. Uh, that's not something I can quantify at this point. Well, the capture should be, you don't put in a software system without saying what the payback would be. Obviously, you believe that if you're putting in the system to track time, you, you, the, the thought is that you're going to have more accurate and more timely reporting regarding their hours and you're going to pay people better. Is that correct? Yep. So the thought is that you, because right now, is everything done manually, including like vacation tracking and th that type of thing? Done manually, or it's either done manually for vacation tracking or time collection. It's virtually non-existent. So, which depart system. which departments would be doing time collection? Now we're under the system. Right now, the only department that substantially punches clocks is DPW has time clocks that they do. Uh, the rest of the departments, we run an exception payroll, so the system defaults to paying them their full pay. And there's not a process beyond that that captures anybody's time. Okay, in the future, who's going to do time reporting? Who, I mean, groups? Which groups? Which departments? Like, where are you going to roll this out? Go ahead. It's my expectation that all the departments will. I believe police and fire already have systems. Um, so it would be the rest of the town except for police and fire. So police and fire do do this. So it's not just DPW. Police and fire do time reporting as well, right? I'm not familiar with their systems. I don't know whether they actually capture time or whether they're primarily scheduling software. I think they're okay, primarily I'm, scheduling software. Yeah, I'm just looking for the business case here. That That's kind of what I'm looking for. We're saying we're going to do it, and that's great. I'm just looking for the business case as to what do we get? Do we expect that we're going to replace uh, police and fire's timekeeping system with, with the new one? Is that the goal? No. no oh, I, it's I, not. I can't speak, speak to that enough because I'm not familiar with their systems at all. So I can't speak to the police and fire system. I can just speak to the fact that under wage and hour law, we're supposed to be, ca we're supposed to be capturing people's time, and we don't do that right now. Okay, so you're saying this is a regulatory issue? Yes. Okay, but, but DP. Well, that's what I'm looking for. What do you expect to? What do you expect to get in productivity over this? Do you know? People showing up to work on time. No, that's a that's a wise answer. I'm talking about what percentage? Do we think it's five percent? Do we think it's ten percent? What do we think it is? So, Tom, this is about accountability. And this is all part of my vision when I came in. I want everybody working the amount of hours they are supposed to be working. And I don't want people being paid for hours they did not work. And there right. currently is no place for anybody to track anything. And so when Jim came on, he explained that towns all have these. Our town does not. So it makes sense to have it. DPW has a punching system where they all stand in line, which is ridiculous. Uh, the library passes around a piece of paper where people are writing in their hours, which is inefficient as hell. And it just doesn't make any sense. So this is not, this is not to, uh, to uh, make money because we're not a business, we're a municipality. This is to track employees and hold people accountable who are not working the hours. Right. It's to the, it's to pay them an honest, oh, sure. it's to pay them an honest wage for the hours that are worked. So I guess what yes. I'm asking is, do we think we have leakage in the system? If we have leakage, meaning people are saying they're working hours that they're not working or they're giving inaccurate information, I understand that we don't know exactly what that is. But do we think that's 1%, 2%, 3%? When this has been implemented in other municipalities, right? what have they found the differential is before the system was input versus after the system was input? That's really my question. What can we expect to see for the funds that we expend here? 
Yeah, I mean, I bet, you know, the issue is you're asking to do an analysis where we have no baseline data. Sure. No well, what if other towns? Data. Did you do it in other towns? I've worked in six towns. Right. Did you ever implement this before? Oh, I have. And what did you see in terms of the results after implementation versus before? That's all. I had a high confidence that we were paying people appropriately after we implemented. Right, but what did the out, what happened with the number of hours reported? What was the differential? Did you have a differential? No. No, if we're paying people for 35 hours now, and the time system after we put it in pays them 35 hours, there's no cost savings. The savings is the concern that, in fact, they're not working 35 hours, and how much are we getting beat out of that exercise? Where now, at least if we have a system, we have some accountability. So there was no the differential time. between what we're between what they were paying. Or is there no metric? Or is there no metric to discern it? So it also tracks vacation time. So, for example, if a department head puts in for vacation, you know, it, we know that someone was on vacation or they weren't. As you know, our town has paid off out a significant amount of money to employees who have either retired or were terminated uh, based on vacation time. And it has come to our attention over the past year that there's no tracking of any of this. So no one really knows except for the person just saying, oh yeah, I didn't take any of that vacation time. So with this tracking system, it allows us to have a better understanding of who's here and when they're here. And it's, it's overall just being fiscally responsible and good stewards of taxpayers' money. Also, there's an accountability factor that people, you know, have to, are being paid for when they're actually here. And, you know, and it's, other there's... Towns, other towns are doing it. We should be doing it. And we did have this. So, so that, that, that implies that we could be paying people for a vacation that uh, is inaccurate because it hasn't been tracked, right? Or it hasn't been tracked in a system, right? Correct. It was not ever been tracked. So that in, in, go ahead. Just to, you know, cause I, I, I'm not trying to look to not give some kind of data that would be useful. I know, for example, I think there's a white paper that was put out by Kronos that addresses some of this in a, um, the studies that they've done on their own wouldn't be specific to us, but there is some analysis that they do that where That's, you know, they're trying to sell you a product. So they're, they're, they're trying to sell you a product, so obviously they're going to show that this saves money. Well, that's time. what I'm trying to, I mean, that's exactly what I'm trying to look for. I know we don't have data specific to us. What I'm looking for, and it doesn't have to be Kronos, but it has to be, you know, you've been to six different towns. Other towns have implemented that type thing, right? We're dropping a lot of money on software. I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to do, but we're increasing our ongoing expense. And I'm trying to figure out what type of efficiencies are we getting out of it. That's all. It can be anecdotal information that, hey, other towns did this and realized that on an annual basis, they were under tracking vacation by 2%, right? Uh, you know, they were under tracking sick, sick time by this, or they understood that, you know, the number of hours worked weren't really what had been reported under the old system, right? Thing, things of that sort that show, you know, you put in a software system to track timeliness and accurate, uh, accuracy and speed. So how does this help us be more accurate and how does this speed up and make us more efficient? That's all I'm trying to get to, because this is a significant amount of money that we're going to drop on an annual basis here at this point. And by the way, I'm not at all implying it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I'm just trying to get to more specifics on what our expectation is. So when you, you got to come back before us to implement this and sign the contract, right? I don't, you know, I don't know the process here. So I, no, I wasn't it already funded? Didn't we fund it in the last? It's funded already. Yeah, we funded in the last budget, Tom. Um, so, so what's this fifty-one? That's the software estimated software cost. Is well, is it software or is it the no, is it the annual license fee? It's thirty-five, I think, is the estimate. 
is the annual license fee? Yeah, that's just our guess of what it'll be approximately. So, the, so it was funded this year, but we have done nothing with it yet, right? So we haven't signed a contract with it yet. We haven't, we haven't put out an RFP yet. Right. I think the RFP will result in a contract, right? I assume so, yeah. Yeah, so if it, if it does, it's got to come back before the Board of Selectmen, I think. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you. You know, I was just making the comment and, and for me, you know, Tom used the word anecdotal. I mean, I think that's, you know, even if we could hear that, I know in the private sector, it's, it's just par for the course. At, at my job, we use Bamboo HR and it tracks our days off and our time. You know, all, all of that is good information. It's a good metric. And that accountability moving forward, I think, is going to be important, and it may give us data that we don't yet have. But you know, to Tom's point, I just think that it's important that we people understand the rationale behind it and understand it without any kind of defensiveness, or because it is a good thing to support and it's a good thing to have in place. And I think it's good for department heads to be able to use for employees. And and so so for me, in theory, it's a good idea. It just I think it's the uh, it's the rationale and the understanding of why we're doing it. Not that, and again, I don't want to speak for Mr. Flynn. Not that we should or we shouldn't, because I think we're both saying it's a good idea. So, Correct. Hundred yeah, percent. I, I would I would just I would just point out this: the, the single biggest problem you have is not, and I appreciate that people want to have metrics and, and do an analysis. The single biggest problem is if you have a wage and hour audit, we do not have records that would indicate what somebody worked. Without those records, the way the state wage and hour division works is they take the employee's word for what hours they work. Yep. No, we so, great. If there's no I, other I, reason, if there's no other reason than that, we should put a system in because I, right now the town is exposed uh, to I, an inability to defend itself in a wage and hour complaint. And I think it's a great metric to have for moving forward. You know, I say I, it, this is not about looking back. I think it's about you know, again, part of that modernization. So I, I think that's all. Yep. I, I don't think we're questioning the why of it. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Nothing Thank for you. me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, what do we have next? Uh, yeah, come on up. You want to do it, Caitlin uh, or Jared? I don't know how far we can go with that. Yeah. Um, just I do have a five five p.m. hard out based on what was or planned. So I just hope that's okay. All right, he's just going to talk a little bit about this, and then um. Then we'll wrap it up. Cool. I'm just going to talk in uh, in generalities about the contingency. Uh, the idea was to set some funds aside for future contracts to get settled on current unsettled contracts, and so we have um, put an amount in there uh, that we think. Uh, and uh, hope to be sufficient to cover the settlement of future contracts. And you can see the amount. Yeah, so the amount is on page 100. I think um, we have. I think as part of this contingency, Jared, um, which I appreciate you talking to. I think um, it's appropriate that maybe, and and it doesn't have to be now. But maybe we go into private executive session and you talk a little bit about the calculation of the contingency um, when you yep. can. Yep. We can do that in the future. <clears throat> yeah, I would agree. I don't uh, know if we have to discuss it, but. Agreed. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to go into it too deep. Yeah, totally there. understandable. Um, we can go on to the contribution to surplus. 
the is this is this pretty straightforward? Currently, we have an 11 point uh, four. Uh, our our surf our uh, excuse me. Our <laughs> the contribution to our fund balance. Um, right now, we're at about 11.4, and so what we're doing with this additional money that you see on page 101, uh, 2.2 million dollars, is to keep it at that level. So this is a kind of do no harm, hold harmless amount that we're putting in here. So it will increase the amount that we have in there, which um, I believe will go up to about 30. Six and a half million with this contribution uh, between there and 37 million, which will be the, the most that we've had in there in the history of the town. And can you um, again explain a little bit just for people listening in for the record? The and it moves forward last year, it is it, it moves forward, right? So that's why it zeroes out. My understanding, I'm just looking, sorry, I'm looking as I'm asking my question. Um, what kinds of expenses would be used for that 2.2, for instance? No, so this is a, this is essentially an appropriation of money that would go into the, uh, into the town fund balance as a, as a reserve for the town. It doesn't, uh, unless, unless the uh, board decides, it doesn't get spent on, on anything. It's there in case we have uh, an issue. What happens is, sure. Sure. yeah, it's a reserve. Yeah. So let me, yeah, let me take a take a shot at this. Um, in order to keep our AAA bond rating, and in fact, it's good for any town, you need to have cash held in reserve in right. case something unforeseen happens. It's your savings account. Uh, in order to keep our AAA bond rating in a, in a uh, state such as Connecticut, that's based on property taxes that's in the Northeast and subject to hurricanes and things like that, and has the issues that the state has fiscally, we need to keep a certain percentage of our annual budget in uh, a reserve in cash. Uh, that percentage we've held at about a little over 11, just a smidge over 11% for the past several years. The Board of Finance will reconstitute their fund balance committee, which will go back out into the marketplace and work with uh, our outside advisors to tell us whether that 11% is appropriate or whether that should be raised or lowered, depending on what's going on with the rating agencies and in the market. Um, so the, that's under their purview, but this was established a number of years ago as the budget continued to grow, but our reserves didn't keep pace. So the policy was passed by the Board of Finance that each year uh, when the budget is raised, we need to main, at least maintain meaning quote unquote, do no harm to that reserve as a percentage of the budget. And right. that's what it was for. So when I'm looking back at fiscal year 18, 19, it was, you know, in 18, it was 538 and 19. Yeah. And understanding that in fiscal year 20, it was 1.3. It's a bit, it's a big jump. So we still, this still counts. Is there a reason that it makes sense to jump the 900,000? And I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what it does, Nance, is it just keeps us at the 11% rate, a little over 11%. Which, again, arguable, and it will go to the Board of Finance if we have the appetite to to make it a little bit lower, closer to 10, or just, but. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say, in my perspective, it's not, quote, unquote, arguable, um, but you're absolutely right. It goes to the Board of Finance, and then they can review it from there. Uh, prerogative uh, in order to keep us in, in line with credit rating ex expectations, et cetera. Yeah, and again, I think just publicly, like the, the nuance and all of this stuff, people don't understand. They're just going to see this big nugget for a thing that's like, you know, what people will see is the rainy day account. And I know that's not what it is, but um, just to be able to uh, have language that really explains it is helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understood. It, there's nobody out there lobbying for the fund balance, yeah. right? That that's really what you're saying. Yeah. All right.
right, any other questions there? No. What's next on the list? Do we have? I would respectfully, I know that we talked about a five o'clock hard out. I have a work call that I scheduled to five because of it. So if it's possible to carry this over to tomorrow. I'm fine with that. Okay, so, excuse me, tomorrow we're going to start at 11 a.m. Uh, to accommodate Mr. Flint has some um, work Thank you. Uh, things. And so we, we'll do is start at 11 and let's plan for a one o'clock break. And I think, I mean, let's just take 40 minutes if that works for everybody. It does. Okay. And then yeah, I'm totally fine right. with that. I would even so say if 30, 30 minutes is fine if we want to even bargain a little further. Sure, that's fine. And, too. So yeah, and I'm fine with that as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll start at 11 and then we'll break at 1. We have to, but we're going to be starting with some items if you notice the agenda. And then we'll go to the education um, budget presentation. That's fine. All right. Great. Thank you for all the work today. All right. Do we have to everyone. do we have to make a motion to close or anything? Oh, make, uh, yeah, make um, a motion to adjourn. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor. All right. Thank you all very much. All right. Have a good, evening, have a good night. Everyone. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.